I'm a woman in my 30s who lives alone in a small house at the head of a quiet cul-de-sac in the UK. The street is a maze of roads away from the main road, which means that other than delivery guys and the occasional salesperson, you very rarely see anyone that you don't recognize. I don't exactly know all of my neighbors, but I do know what they look like, and I know where they live. I can recognize their cars, etc. Now, this weirdness happened over the space of a few months several years back. I work from home, so I'm usually in, and sometimes I don't have a lot to do. The first day was one of those lazy days. It was about 4pm and I'm sitting on the sofa watching some daft stuff about alien cover-ups or whatever. Someone knocked on the door. I have a surveillance camera hidden in the wooden canopy above the front door so I checked to see who it was because I wasn't expecting any deliveries and I couldn't be bothered to deal with a salesperson. It was a woman who looked late 40s to early 50s, very smartly dressed, like really expensive clothes and even jewellery. Stuff I could never afford, in fact. Most people around here generally couldn't afford it either. But we're not an affluent area by any means, and this lady stuck out like a sore thumb. She looked flustered and agitated, glancing towards the back garden before trying to look through the tiny frosted glass window on the front door. I noticed that she was carrying a dog's lead, but I didn't see a dog. As it happens... At the far side of my back garden, there are two hedges. There's the hedge that I own within my property boundaries, and there's a second hedge outside my boundary that's council-owned, along a sort of small grassland where people walk dogs. I know for a fact that there is a hole in the council-owned hedge, which I've reported it to council at least a dozen times over the past decade, and they've done the square root of sort all about it. Because of my hedge, though, I cannot reach it to do anything about it myself. Consequently, when I saw the dog's lead, I thought, oh no, I bet her dog has gone through that hole. If it's a big dog, it's not getting into my garden, but if it's a small dog, it might be able to work its way through, and I've always got some cooked meat, so I figured that I might be able to lure it out. I'm a dog lover at heart, so of course I, I want to help this woman if I can. When I was a kid, my dog went missing for a few weeks too, and I thought that I was never going to get him back. I was heartbroken for those weeks, but fortunately we did get him back, and ever since I've been extremely sensitive to pets in need. Anyway, I open the door and this woman gives me the weirdest look, like she was expecting someone completely different to answer the door and that I shouldn't be there. To be fair to her, my mum used to live here too, so I didn't think much of that weird look to begin with. Maybe she was expecting her. In any case, I say hello, and she sort of just stares at me for the longest 30 seconds before she tries to look past me and asks to see Margaret. I don't know what it is about other people's mistakes, but whenever someone has the wrong number, I always end up apologizing as if it's my fault. So that's what I did. I apologized and told her that there was no Margaret at this address. Again, she gives me that look. Only this time there's anger behind it. Yes, there is, she insists. It occurs to me at this point that I have a relative called Margaret, but she lives about 60 miles away and I haven't seen her in years. Nevertheless, just in case she's got her addresses muddled, I ask, are you looking for Margaret, and gave the surname, but she just hisses at me, you know exactly who I'm looking for, what have you done with her? I am absolutely lost at this point. I've lived here 20 years, and I know the name of the previous owner, so I know that she's not asking for them. I also know the names of the neighbors, and the names of the people who have lived on the street in the time that I've been here and since moved and none of them are called Margaret. So all I can do is tell her that she's got the wrong address. No, this is, and her name, and her address, you're lying. That was a tad alarming. I mean, she's definitely at the right address. She's not knocked on the wrong door. However, she clearly thinks that I've done something to somebody who, to the best of my knowledge, has never lived here. 
I don't know how long the previous owner had this house, but we must be talking about at least 30 years since anyone called Margaret might have actually lived here. It's at this point that I noticed that she subtly wrapped that dog lead around her now clenched fist, like she's planning to use it as a weapon. In my youth, I did plenty of self-defense training, so I'm not exactly scared of her as such, but I'm obviously getting a bit concerned about the situation that's brewing. I don't particularly wish to get involved in a brawl on my doorstep with a complete stranger after all. I'm torn between shutting the door in her face or trying to de-escalate the situation. In the end, I close the door a little so she's got less to aim at and tell her, Look, I don't know who you're looking for, but if you think something's happened to your friend, then maybe just call the police and let them sort it out. Sure enough, the woman slams her fist with the lead wrapped around it into my door. I later discovered, too, that she'd struck the door hard enough to crack the frosted glass window in the middle of it. She's bleeding from doing it. It must have hurt, but she doesn't flinch or show any sign of pain. What the heck, right? Any confidence that I had in my self-defense classes started to waver here a bit because I'm not used to people who don't feel pain. All I can think now is that she's on something and having a really bad trip. So at this point, I put on my scariest voice and tell her to get back. I let her know that I'm calling the police and if she's still here and they get here, she can deal with them because I'm not dealing with her anymore. She then tries to stop me from closing the door, but I shove her back and manage to get it closed and locked. I make a point to stand next to the door while I'm calling 999 so she can hear me. While I'm waiting for the police to turn up, I watch her on surveillance feed. She moves out of shot multiple times, presumably to check the back of the house, and I hear her calling out for Margaret. A few minutes before the police finally turn up, I see her kick my wheelie bins in a rage, but then the most chilling thing happens. She walks back to the front door and literally stares directly into my camera. Now, that camera is pretty well hidden. I'm not saying that nobody could spot it, but most people would only know it was there if they'd been looking for it. Most people aren't looking for cameras, right? But she knew that it was there. She must have eyeballed it previously. When, I don't know. But I later reviewed all the footage I had from that day, and she never made eye contact with it once. She never even looked in that direction. I only had about a week's worth of footage before it, the oldest footage is overwritten, and I checked everything that I had and she was only on the camera that day. All I can think is that maybe she had been here more than a week prior or something. While she's staring right into it though, she flips me the finger and then makes a throat cutting gesture before turning and walking off. I head to the window to watch her leave and she's walking like she doesn't have a care in the world. She doesn't look back and just wanders away. Police finally show up. Good job I wasn't being murdered. Take a statement. I give them a copy of the surveillance footage and that's that. I called a couple of times to follow up but nothing. Nobody ever called me about it too. I won't lie too. This had me up for a few weeks. I moved the knife block closer to the door as well, though out of sight of any of the windows. I started staying up really late and not getting much sleep, which really didn't help. On some nights I was so tired that I started experiencing auditory hallucinations. I'd hear people who weren't there talking, and because this woman was the curse of all of my stress, I heard her voice and the name Margaret most of all. Every time I heard the gate open, it always put me on edge. I'd review the surveillance footage every day, and eventually as the weeks passed and I hadn't heard anything else, I started to regain some of my comfort and just put it down to a, a really weird experience. But it didn't last. About four, maybe five weeks perhaps, after the first encounter, she came back. It was just after midnight I was in the living room mucking about on my phone with the TV on low volume for some background noise. I heard a car door slam and I peeked out the front window. A 
dark colored car was parked at the end of my driveway. I couldn't see what make or model it was, but it looked like some sort of, I don't know, maybe a state car? I think Americans call them station wagons, right? I didn't see anyone moving about, but a minute or two later, the front gate swung open with its metallic groaning, and there was a knock on the door. Even when I'm not involved in a blood feud over imaginary Margarets, I'm not going to enter the door at that time. I check the surveillance camera. Its night vision mode is pretty bad, but I am positive it is that woman again. I can even see what I think is a dog lead as well. And of course, she knows I'm watching her because she looks at the camera again. And I tell you, when somebody is already giving you the heebie-jeebies like this, the way night vision makes people's eyes look like soulless black voids doesn't do much to make you feel better. Suddenly she yells out, shut that racket off and come out here now. I had the TV on, but as I mentioned, it was on a very low volume, which was so weird because I mean, there's no way that she could have heard it from outside the front door. I mean, I couldn't even hear it if I walked into the hallway. I'm convinced at this point that she's mentally unwell, so I call the police again. I want them to stay on the line, but they just tell me that someone will be over soon and to call them back immediately if things escalate. So I'm waiting, watching, and just hoping that she doesn't start trying to smash a window or something. She kicks over my wheelie bins again. I don't know what she's got against them, but whatever. And yells something else out, which I couldn't quite make out, but... Whatever it was, it was enough for one of the neighbors to come and investigate themselves. I watched the neighbor talking with her for a minute. She's remonstrating about something, wagging her finger towards my front door, but my neighbor is eventually able to get her to leave. He even sticks around for a bit to make sure that she's gone. Sadly, that also means that she's gone before the police turned up again and made me feel like I was a bother to them. Another statement... Handing over more security footage, more nothing. I caught up with the neighbor the next day and he apologized because it didn't occur to him to make a note of the registration plate, but he told me that she'd said much the same thing as she said to me previously. She wanted to know where Margaret was and what I'd done with her. I'm grasping for answers at this point. I mean, even if she is mentally unwell, the fact that she's sticking to this Margaret story and has the right address makes me think that there's something more to this than somebody having a breakdown. But then it clicks. Is Margaret her dog? Does she think that I've stolen her dog? Did she have a dog go through the hole in the back? Does she think that I've hurt her dog? Is that what this is all about? It'd be another few weeks before she came back. This time at 3am, I'm awoken by knocking on the door... A few minutes later, I hear tapping on the bedroom window. I know that it's her instantly. I can hear her saying things, but I cannot really make them out because they're too muffled through the windows. It's like she didn't want to get the neighbor out again, so she's trying to keep quiet this time. I jump out of bed and put some clothes on as quickly as I can. I try and follow her as best as I can as she moves around the outside of the house from room to room, knocking, tapping, and muttering. I think that I hear a few coherent words like noise racket. I'm pretty sure she called me some expletives as well, but maybe I was imagining that. I can't check the surveillance footage this time because she spray painted the lens. Not that it'd matter much this time. She's not lingering by the front door at all. I think about calling the police again, but honestly, it's just proven to be a waste of time so far, and I get the feeling that if I call them out a third time and she's gone, then they're just going to start accusing me of wasting their time, even if I do have the evidence. They've not exactly been that helpful so far, after all. In the end, I wait by the front door and listen to her. Eventually, she knocks again, and I call out, Is Margaret your dog? Dead silence nothing. I can't see anything through the frosted glass because it's too dark. I have no idea where she is and I don't want to turn the outside lights on. To be honest, I don't even know why I feel this way. She knows that I'm in the house because I've called out to her, but I still don't want to draw any more attention to myself. 
I end up standing there for who knows how long, at least an hour, probably more because the sun starts coming up. My heart is going a mile a minute pretty much the whole time. Once it's bright enough, I start checking through the windows to see if I can see her, but no, nothing. I tentatively open the front door and look outside. I still cannot see her. I grab something to arm myself with just in case. I can't remember what it was now, but I check all around my house and the back garden, but she's not there. But as I'm heading back to the front door, I spot the oddest thing. The gate is closed. That gate is physically attached to the side of my house and when it opens and closes, it makes a fair bit of noise. You'd immediately hear it if someone opened or closed it when you were standing next to the front door, but it's closed. So what does that mean? Did she jump it somehow? It's possible, I guess, but I certainly wouldn't want to try it. Anyway, I open the gate and head out to the end of the driveway. I look around and there's no sign of anyone. I turn back to the house and I see that she spray painted liar on the front door of my house and left the dog lead on the floor beneath it. That was, thankfully, the last time that I ever heard from or saw this woman, but I think she still comes by sometimes. Ever since all this happened, I get this really creeped out feeling occasionally at night and I always check out the window. I don't know whether I'm imagining it or what, but every now and again, I swear that I see a dark colored estate car out on the street, not parked at the end of my driveway these days, but I just can't shake the feeling that she's in there watching my house. Perhaps she was looking for her dog and she keeps thinking that she'll see me with it at some point. Whatever the case, this whole thing was strange and it shook me. I'm still living with it and I just wish that it never happened to begin with. There is a little hot springs nestled near the peak of the Pesimeroi Pass in central Idaho. Though it is hidden in plain sight, sitting quite literally on the shoulder of the road, it's not a well-known attraction outside of the valley. But the local ranchers are quite familiar with Barney Hot Springs. It's not unusual to drive by on the weekends and see several families enjoying the water. Barney Hot Springs, or simply Barney's, is incredibly remote, even for Idaho standards. It's at least an hour of driving over ruddy dirt roads to the small town of Salmon in the north. If you need a hospital, it's over two hours to the regional hospital in Idaho Falls to the south. To say that you're in the middle of nowhere at Barney's is an understatement. But the seclusion is one of Barney's major drawing points. That and the odd abundance of tropical fish swimming in the year-round warm waters... You can sit back, relax, and take in the surrounding views of the mighty Rocky Mountains with little in the way of distractions. But Barney's isn't all that it seems to be on the surface. You see, an event 40 years ago turned this little hot spring from a local retreat to a local nightmare. On the afternoon of October 27th, two truckers stopped for fuel at my parents' gas station and cafe in Howe, Idaho. They were hauling a load of hay or something, over the Pesimeroi Pass headed for a delivery point somewhere in Utah. As the truck fueled, the two men settled down at the cafe counter and ordered some coffees. Sipping his coffee, the old trucker struck up a conversation with my mother and the regulars in the cafe. He seemed a bit on edge, but was normal in comparison to his younger partner. That young man was clearly shaken and didn't say more than a, a quiet yes ma'am or no ma'am to my mum. He kept his attention on the cup of coffee he cradled in his shaking hands. As the older trucker and the others conversed, he brought up a peculiar event that had happened to them that afternoon. So they had crested the Pesimeroi Pass and were coming down into the Little Lost Valley as they approached Barney Hot Springs. Standing in the middle of the road was what looked to be a child. Bringing the truck to a stop, they soon realized in horror and fascination what was before them. 
It wasn't a child, but an odd, humanoid-looking creature. Its body was slim with long, slender limbs and a squat little torso. The head and the eyes were large and amphibian-like. It was not standing any taller than a preschooler. They could see its green skin shimmer in the brilliant midday sun. Dripping with water, it was clutching a large bundle of what could only be described as hundreds of eggs. The creature watched the truck come to a stop, then awkwardly walked over the rest of the road and down an embankment. It was obvious from the trail of water that it left behind that it had just come from Barney Hot Springs. On the other side of the road was a small stream hidden in dense willow bushes. No sooner had the creature disappeared, the two truckers were driving away as fast as their engine would take them. My mum and a few regulars at the cafe took in the man's story with silent, somber expressions and comforting head nods. This wasn't the first time strange things had happened and been witnessed in this little lost valley. Of course, a, a frogman carrying his brood certainly was the most unique story that they had heard in a long time. The regulars told the trucker not to get too worked up over the incident, as it could have been the autumn sun playing tricks on their eyes. But the reassurance seemed to calm the men. They finished their coffees in a few quick gulps and headed out the door. My mother and the regulars had a good chuckle over the man's story and went on with their day. The following morning on October 28th, one of the largest earthquakes ever recorded in Idaho struck the area. The Bora Peak earthquake was a magnitude 7.5 and could be felt hundreds of miles away. It destroyed farm infrastructure, roads and bridges. It even killed two children on their way to school when a brick building in Chalice, Idaho collapsed on top of them. It was a horrific and frightening day for everyone in Idaho. Barney Hot Springs was not far from the quake's epicenter and did not escape its wrath. A couple passing visitors near the springs that morning watched in amazement as the water drained into the earth, leaving behind a stinky, mucky hole. Minutes later, to their further astonishment, the water came splashing back into the depression, but was now boiling hot. It was a truly bizarre geological event to see. The boiling stopped immediately after the earthquake ceased, and the water at Barney's quickly cooled. It's now more of a, a warm springs, having permanently lost about 15 degrees of temperature after the earthquake. The frogman has been seen a handful of times since that initial sighting, always near Barney's and almost always standing in the road. I personally like to think that the frogman was just a doting parent getting their babies out of harm's way before the earthquake struck and annihilated everything in the hot springs. Barney Hot Springs is still a widely popular spot for the locals. No one seems to be too bothered by the idea of sharing the water with a little odd amphibian man and his family. Someone even reintroduced the tropical fish after the boiling incident killed all of them. It remains just one of the many weird stories to come out of the Lost Rivers area of Idaho where I grew up. My friend was born in France and her dad's side of the family is something like 17th in line for the throne or something. Basically, her dad's side of the family has historically been very high class French people and they have a lot of um, haunted stuff from pre 20th century France. One of these things is a dresser with a mirror. The family legend goes that in the 1800s, a girl died sitting at the dresser in front of that mirror. Fast forward to 2023, that dresser and mirror is in my friend's apartment. One night we had a party and after everyone left at around two in the morning, she fell asleep on her bed and I tried to fall asleep on her couch. It was not quite pitch black yet. I felt safe, but for some reason I just couldn't shake the feeling that someone was watching me. I tried to ignore it and just go to sleep. I closed my eyes and started to get tired. After a few moments of attempting to drift off to sleep, I suddenly got a terrible feeling in my gut that something was very wrong. 
I felt a presence standing next to the couch too. I really don't know how to describe this feeling too. I just knew that there was something there. I shut my eyes tighter, hoping maybe I was just being paranoid. And then something touched my foot. Something literally touched my foot. I felt pressure on the couch right next to my foot, and the blanket brushed against my foot in a way that could only suggest that something had hit or poked the blanket right next to it. It almost felt like someone was about to grab my feet, but got scared and chickened out at the last second. This wasn't some weird thing with the air conditioning or anything too. This felt very human and very solid. My eyes snapped open and I suddenly woke up. For a split second, I could still feel the pressure around my foot, so I know that it was a real sensation that I was feeling and not just some weird dream thing where you think something is happening in a dream, but when you wake up and don't feel it anymore, it's obvious. Plus, I didn't even fall asleep in the first place. I was just laying there with my eyes closed. At first, I honestly thought that maybe my friend had managed to get out of bed and walk past me so quietly that I didn't notice, but accidentally brushed up against my foot or something. But then I turned my head to where my feet were and I saw a, a humanoid shadow standing there, just right there, looming over me. Clear as day, too. Like I said, it wasn't quite pitch black in the room, but this thing, whatever it was, was absolutely null of any sort of light. When I saw it, my blood instantly ran cold, and I got that gut feeling that says, get out quickly. I blinked, looked away, but when I looked back, it was gone. I quickly turned around to check if my friend was out of bed, but she wasn't. In fact, she seemed to be fast asleep. I turned on my phone and used the light from the screen to investigate a little bit, but nothing. There was nothing lying on the couch around my foot, there was nothing around the room. So, what could I have possibly felt? I mean, there wasn't anything in that room that looked even vaguely like a human silhouette. So, what was that shadow and where did it come from? My instincts were screaming at me to leave, so I grabbed my bag, slipped on my shoes, and I just left. Somehow I felt safer walking around New York at 2.30 in the morning than I did inside of my friend's apartment. So, what do you guys think about any of this? I feel like it must be connected to the dresser and the mirror in some way, right? But the entity had such a dark energy. It didn't feel like it could have been the ghost that's supposedly attached to the dresser. If anyone has any idea about what I should do about all of this, then I would love to hear it. Should I talk to my friend? Should we do something about this? Please, do let me know. I'm currently dog-sitting for my grandparents, who live in a very rural part of upstate New York. They've got three Dobermans who I love very much and I pretty regularly stay over to help with the dogs when my grandparents are out, just so that they don't have to be kenneled and all that. My grandpa, he used to be a volunteer fireman and he always had a police scanner turned on at all hours so that he could be ready if something happened. He hasn't helped with the fire brigade in years but the scanner is still on in their house. I've gotten very used to the staticky noises that it makes and tend to tune them out until last night. You see, I was standing in the kitchen next to the scanner while I was making dinner, and I suddenly became aware of the whispering coming from the scanner. I've been listening to this thing jabber for 21 years now, and I've never heard a whisper like this. But that's not really the part that freaks me out the most. My grandparents moved from an old farmhouse a, a couple of years ago. The farm was built about 200 years ago, and it was absolutely haunted. There was this one distinct sound that always happened when I was home alone in that house, and it was the sound of a couple arguing. When they moved into this new house, I never heard a thing. No footsteps, you arguing, no doors opening, nothing. Until last night when the whispering started, 
and I started hearing the arguing, just like the old house. It sounded like it was coming from outside in the driveway. There's a window above the sink in the kitchen that you can see the whole driveway from, and when I looked, there was nothing. Just some birds sitting under the feeder my grandparents have set out there. But then, the arguing seemed to escalate into screaming, and suddenly all the birds took off. I stepped out onto the back porch to let the dogs back inside and just stood there to see if I could hear the arguing from the front. It seemed to come out of the woods in front of me, so in the end I just went back inside and I locked the door. I really didn't know what to do, so I shut all of the curtains in the house and slept as far away from the driveway as possible with the dogs. Now, I tend not to get freaked out about bumps around the house, but being in a haunted house alone in the middle of a town is much different than out in the woods. I know the consequences of getting too comfortable out here, and it had me worried. I'm not really sure if this will have any kind of explanation. I guess I just wanted to share it here because it's just so strange, right? If you've listened this long, then thanks for hearing me out, and here's hoping that we don't have a repeat of that old haunted farmhouse. This happened uh, a couple of years ago now. I, a 26-year-old female, was walking my dog Indy in my local field. It was dark, but it wasn't late. It was winter time in the UK, so maybe 6pm. The field is mainly used for rugby or football, but is completely free to walk through whenever. It's also surrounded by houses and streetlights on the roads, but the field itself is dark, so I had brought a torch with me, mainly so that I didn't tread into some dog poo. I've come in one entrance of the field, and I'm following a path that leads to another exit or entrance. I use the field to make a loop back around to the road and back to my house, giving my dog some off-lead time whilst in the field. Anyway, as I'm walking up the field, I notice a figure walk in the exit or entrance that I was going to use to leave. I keep my eye on this figure as they have very dark clothing on and their hood up. I'm shining my torch as I'm walking so I know the person knows that I'm there as it's very obvious. And at first I wasn't really nervous, more so just being vigilant I guess. Indy is a wonderful German shepherd so as you can imagine, I feel pretty safe with her anyway. It wasn't until I saw the person duck down behind a bush or a tree. There's lots of new trees and bushes planted sporadically up the part of the field that isn't used for sports that I absolutely froze. I was about 200 feet from the exit, but would have to walk past that bush, the one that they hid behind, to get to it. I call Indy over and get her on the lead so that she's close. By this point, she is also hyper alert due to the person ducking behind the bush she obviously noticed too but with that I hear a, a weird sort of high-pitched voice that sounded like they were saying my dog's name I assume they heard me call her they said it maybe three or four times in this sort of longed out high-pitched voice it clearly was coming from the person hiding luckily Indy wasn't reacting to it as it probably barely sounded like her name to her it was then that I had a moment of shall I fight or flight. Either I, one, run past the bush and try for the exit, two, turn around and run back into the dark field and make for the other exit, a lot further away though, or three, confront this guy. Indy at this point is hackles up, ears up and very alert in front of me, all whilst still maintaining a wonderful sense of calm. In the end, I went with number three. I decided to confront this dude. I mustered up every bit of courage and confidence that I had and shouted at the top of my lungs, what are you doing? The hooded man came out from the bush very quickly without saying anything and I said the same thing again, what are you doing, trying to scare a young woman? I'm so glad that my voice didn't shake or break when I said it as I really was terrified at this point. He started to stutter and said, Oh, oh, I, I thought that you were someone that I knew. I answered back and said, Who hides from someone that they think that they know in a dark field? After that, he apologized a couple of times and continued to skulk down the rest of the field. 
and I made for a swift exit with Indy. Who knows what his intentions actually were. I mean, maybe he thought that I had a smaller dog and was going to try to attack me. Maybe he saw Indy and realized no chance. Or maybe he really did think that I was someone that he knew. Whatever the case was, it was weird and really, really scary. On Friday, I left work at lunchtime to go for an overnight bushwalk to a remote campsite in a national park that is about 60 kilometers from my work in Canberra. I decided not to take a tent as I was planning to sleep in a hut that has a fireplace. It's still winter here. This hut is about two kilometers walk from many fire trails and can only be reached by walking along a narrow foot track that climbs up a hill for about 45 minutes. The hut only gets a handful of visitors each year due to how difficult it is to find and reach it. My car was the only one in the car park and I never passed anyone else on the way. There's only one track in and out of this place too. So when it got dark, I started a fire in the fireplace and had my dinner. I was tired and decided to go to sleep at around 8.30pm as I planned to get up early to walk back to my car early in the morning. But at around 1am, I woke up to the sound of a loud machine. Really loud, like being directly under a helicopter or something. When I peered through the hut's window, I could see bright lights flashing around, lighting up the trees, but... I couldn't see the source of where the lights was coming from, which made me think that they must be above me. There was no way that I was going outside to investigate, so I just sat on a camp chair, wondering what the heck was outside. After a few minutes, both the sound and the lights stopped suddenly like they'd never been there. Now, there was nowhere for anything to land nearby as the hut is in a heavily treed area. After a few minutes, I got the courage to go outside with my head torch and all I could see was that some grass, it had been slightly burned around the hut. Nothing else seems to have been damaged or disturbed, but I stayed up for the remainder of the night and left for my car just before daylight came. There's no way that a vehicle could get to the hut and I don't think that search and rescue would have a helicopter up at night in such a remote area like that. Plus, there's really no Air Force bases nearby either. The National Park doesn't allow hunters, so I really have no idea what it was or what was going on. Also, I don't drink or use any drugs and I'm not on any medication that could alter my perception. I also don't have any mental health issues or anything. So, do you guys have any idea as to what this could have been? Has anyone else had a similar unexplained encounter like this, particularly around Canberra or in Australia? So I was just watching a YouTube video about some scary internet rabbit holes and the hat man came up during it. As I was listening, I heard the guy describe it as uh, wearing a wide brimmed hat and a trench coat. And this is the first time that I'd heard about the trench coat and suddenly uh, a memory hit me very vividly. I'm in my mid-30s and this memory takes place in one of the first houses that I ever lived in when I was maybe five or six. So this was decades ago now but I do remember at the time the memory was vivid for months but I guess it faded over time. Anyway... The house that I lived in had a big front window which was in the living room and next to it was the front door. This door was not the main door that we or guests used as the side door was right off the driveway. So it was very odd when during the night, maybe 8pm, sundown and dark but not late night, I heard a knock at the door, a single knock. I turned and looked out the window and saw what at the time I thought was dark winged duck. I know, it's kind of humorous to hear that, but as a kid, that's honestly what I thought it was. A big, wide-brimmed hat, what looked like a long coat, but all black. And there were street lights there, so it wasn't pitch black, but dark winged duck was just the silhouette. Of course, there was no beak or anything, but that was what my mind went to. 
I was also extremely creeped out at that moment and for weeks or months following. I asked my parents if they were going to answer the door and they asked why. They didn't hear the knock apparently. I was afraid to look outside but I forced myself and when I did, there was no one there. But this YouTube video reminded me of this and I had so many chills that it was crazy. I don't know why this mention of a trench coat pinged this for me but it just hit me. It's kind of cool to think that something beyond the normal happened to me at least once in my life but still it definitely sent shivers down my spine. Feel free to discuss or share your own thoughts about this experience. I'd love to hear more directly from people as opposed to compilation videos and the like. If you have any theories as to what this could have been then be my guest. I'm a woman living alone in my apartment that is located on the ground floor and so my balcony is very visible for others to see. Like every night, I work at 4 in the morning so I leave at around 3.40am. Unfortunately in France they decided to turn off the lights from 10pm to like 6am I think. But thankfully for me, the landlord where I live turned the lights on just for me from 3am to 4am. It is very dim but I'm still thankful for it. Anyway, this Thursday night I leave like always. I go into my car, locked it, turned on my lights and something caught my eye so I looked up and thought that was just a cat jumping from my balcony because they love to come by just looking around and then they leave. But it wasn't a cat. It was a man standing next to my balcony. I think the light surprised him and I'm looking at him walking away from me on the grass but he can't leave that way so I'm staring at him scared and calmly crying not knowing what to do for like 10 seconds but then I can see movement again and it's him walking towards me looking at me quickly and then just continuing to walk to the main road like nothing happened. He takes one last look at me in my car before I lose sight of him. Also he was wearing black sweatpants and a camo jacket and it's pretty weird. I don't know what he was doing here, if he was sleeping on my plastic sofa on my balcony or I don't know what but I cannot stop thinking about his face looking at me or what could have happened if it was pitch black outside. I wanted to make a report to the police but they said that they can't because there's no damage. The lady also told me no but maybe it wasn't for you, maybe he was looking around for a dwelling or whatever and I said at this hour and in this outfit I don't think so. And then she replied, no I'm talking like a robbery. And I was like, of course, right? Since then every night I run like crazy to my car with pepper spray in my hand. Also I bought surveillance cameras on my balcony just to check before going out at night because now I'm super paranoid and I'm kind of developing OCD and I have to look and check outside before going to sleep too. Anyway. After this, I place the cameras out there like I said. The position is perfect too and I can move the camera from my phone even if I'm not home. But this is where things are getting even weirder. So the first time that I saw someone was 4th of May at 3.40am. In June nothing happened so I thought that maybe it was a one time thing like wrong place wrong time sort of thing. 4th of July, I'm getting ready around 3am and... 20 minutes later I see a notification from my camera on my phone. I didn't get nervous because sometimes my camera just captures bugs or spiders or whatever. But oh boy, my heart skipped a beat when I saw what was on there. I opened the notification and the video started. I saw a man walking straight next to my balcony and he was also hiding his face. I froze like for five minutes and I decided to call the cops because I didn't know if he was still there because the camera didn't send any notifications after that. I noticed that sometimes my camera doesn't capture anything. The cops came and he wasn't there anymore but I was certainly weirded out by the situation. 23rd of August, third time's a charm right? I left for work at 3.45am, yes precisely. And while I was driving, I get a notification at 3.47am. 
and it is again the same dude from July. He is still hiding his face, but I now recognize his gait. I called the cops right away and we met at my place. I was crying and explained that it wasn't the first time that it had happened, that I didn't feel safe and I couldn't understand why this was happening. The male cops were minimizing the situation and that got me really ticked off because they could see that I was confused and scared but they kept saying that there was no need to worry, maybe he's not here for you. I don't care. It's 3am and it's dark outside and a random dude is close to my place, hiding his face like that? Anyway, they couldn't do anything because there were no damages. But I decided to lay down a handrail just in case, even though I know that they can't do anything. I'm still very nervous every night when I have to go to work. I got my pepper spray with me just in case. Also, I have great neighbors around me that kind of helped me in some ways, but I don't know why he's here and why in the middle of the night like that. No idea. I'm sure that I've forgotten some details, so feel free to ask some questions if you would like to try and help me out, but in any case, thanks for listening. Myself, a 21-year-old female, and my partner, 20 and male, were at our friend's new place last night for a few hours, helping them settle in. They're both around our age as well, 19 and 18. One of our friends is known for being very spiritually gifted and connected. She's seen spirits ever since she was able to walk and talk, apparently. I'm very spiritually connected myself, but not in the sense where spirits show themselves to me or anything. Anyways, we're all hanging out in the living room, just chatting and watching Golden Girls when our friend freezes and immediately started crying. We all comforted her and asked what was wrong. I immediately knew by the look on her face that she looked down her hallway and that she had seen something. We all had a weird feeling too, which was odd. It was an eerily quiet moment. She said that she saw so clearly a tall, buff male figure in a long white gown walking across her hallway towards the staircase that leads to the front entrance. This was then followed by many footsteps being heard since they moved in on Saturday. I asked her if it felt negative or anything and she said that she didn't think so but it definitely frightened her a lot. She said that she felt her face go pale and she felt a weight on her chest. We sprung into action, seeing how shaken up they both were after they realized how uncomfortable they now were to be in their new home overnight. So we grabbed some incense, salt, and some selenite from my apartment, and I cleansed every corner of the house with the intention that whatever or whoever was chilling in the apartment would move on. But I guess I'm just curious to see what others think of this experience, and I'd like to know if it could mean anything spiritually. I know that things like this can be typical of major life events such as moving to a new place, but I am looking forward to hearing from anyone who may resonate with this and have anything to add to it. So I'd like to share with you guys an experience that I've had with the hopes to get some advice because quite honestly I'm pretty scared. For context, I'm 26 year old male I've never had any kind of paranormal experiences before or even believed in them last week I moved to a new apartment with my two friends 26 year old female and a 23 year old female in an apartment building built probably in the 60s the apartment has been renovated recently and looks bright and warm it's around 100 meters squared and has three bedrooms the wooden floor although new is very noisy when you step on it the walls are consistent and you barely hear the neighbors. Our landlord is a 70 to 80 year old woman that's been nice with us. She said that the previous renters lived there for about 10 years. Now, the day we first visited the apartment, we really liked the house, but I experienced a weird feeling when I stopped in one of the bedrooms. It was just an odd sort of, I don't know, like uncanny feeling that I quickly forgot about. When we finally moved, first week, everything was normal. But two days ago, when I came back from work at about 8pm, I was on the couch in the living room in silence since nobody else was home. And I heard 
Suddenly, the sound of the creaky floor as if someone was standing in the hallway right in front of the bedroom where I had a feeling when I visited the flat. Then the sound of fingers scratching wood. I keep hearing those sounds for maybe about 30 minutes. I didn't move from the couch, afraid, but also believing that it probably was just a cockroach and the floor reacting to temperature or whatever. One of my roomies came home and everything was normal. The other was out, but there were no more sounds at this point. I had dinner and went to sleep at around 12.30. Once I was in my bedroom, I was lying on my bed, listening to music with pods, and I heard something. I took them off, and I'm now hearing someone stepping behind my closed door. They walk from left to right behind the door, slow but consistent steps. You could tell by the sound that it was an adult body as well. I open WhatsApp and write in the group chat that I have with the roomies here and write to them to stop doing that. They didn't take it seriously though when I told them about the sounds in the hallway and that I thought that they were pulling a prank. Neither the roomie that went to sleep to her bedroom or the one that was out and had returned home opening the door unnoticedly thought that I was being serious. They answer me and send me pictures, audios, and live location, but I keep hearing vividly someone slowly walking behind the door. Then they knock, quiet and slow knocks. My bedroom is very small and the bed is right in front of the door. I was totally conscious and aware of what was happening. It's not noises from the neighbors, it's right in front of the door in fact. So I texted in the group, quick, come. Then I hear my roomie's door opening, her turning the hallway lights on, and her opening my bedroom door. She was scared, asking what was going on. I was sitting in bed, realizing that someone was there, and it was neither of them. I had a bit of a panic attack. I started hyperventilating and feeling my arms numb. Then I started crying and remained at shock all night. My other roomie quickly came home, and they tried to give rational explanations. I slept on the couch with the lights and the TV on that night. Tonight I've done the same. We haven't noticed any noises or weird feelings since then, but I'm constantly afraid and can't see the moment to sleep again in my bedroom. But I am convinced that whatever that was, it actually happened. There was someone behind the door, walking around it and knocking. I don't know what to do about it, but... This whole thing definitely has me rattled. For about two years now, I occasionally hear what clearly is a hand hitting the wall between my room and the attic. Now, before anyone says chipmunks or insert vermin, please just rule that out. Trust me, I've had the area inspected by pest control so many times and there is no visible infestation, and traps and baits were set, and to which go undisturbed even to today. If it is not happening from the other side of the bedroom wall in the attic, then the only other place that it can be coming from is the exterior part of the wall. Picture a garage roof line butting up against a house, wherein the attic is above the garage. This has happened at all hours of the day, mind you, and mostly when I'm alone, but it's happened with my wife in the room too. As a matter of fact, my wife and I hear noises in the house frequently. We are constantly going back and reviewing our security cameras to explain them away. And I would say that a good 80% cannot be explained away. Again, trust me, if anyone is looking for a causation, it is me. A semi-non-believer in the paranormal. But there is just no way to explain this stuff. I've also been in my basement studio and I've heard my wife and kids come through the garage door. I hear the kids running. I have a hot microphone on and studio headphones on as well. I can definitely hear. But when I go upstairs, they're not home yet. There was this one night though when I heard this tapping on the basement bedroom window. This is a finger tapping a window absolutely clear as day. I'm 43 years old and I know what that sounds like. I also know that there's nothing near that window to make such a sound. 
I have that window blocked 100% by a perfectly fitted painting, so no one can actually see in or out. This goes on for about 10 minutes, so I sort of sneak down the hall to the kids' playroom. Think of the letter L, and the two windows are equally spaced from the corner. I sneak over, lights are off. I can see very well, except the shadows of the trees being casted by the streetlights. I just sit there for about 10 minutes, but nothing. The tapping seemed to stop too. I didn't even get two steps into the hallway though, and I heard that tap one time on the playroom window. I was annoyed at this point, and so I darted towards the door, grabbing one of the guns on route, and I'm telling you that no one could have escaped my eyesight by then. But when I got there, there was no one there. I went back and looked at the cameras, and I did everything that I could think of, but there was just nothing. One thing we have caught on camera, though, is this very loud foot stomp from our bedroom, just above the living room. I wasn't home, but my wife and kids are visibly startled as the stomp was so hard that the ceiling light flickered. And again, there is just really no explanation for this. And no, I will not accept house settling or vermin. That is clearly a foot stomping the floor so hard that the lights flickered. Now, the main level laundry room separates my studio from our master bathroom on the second level. My wife has a rolling chair at her vanity and I can hear her rolling around when she's getting ready. I shouldn't, but I do and well, I've texted her at like 2 or 3 in the morning before asking why she's rolling up and around like that. But there's always no response and when I check, she's asleep so it is definitely not her. Other than that, I hear what sounds like a, a man tapping his cane on the floor above my studio quite often. I'm an engineer, I get mechanical systems and knocking, and I can assure you that there are no systems or equipment or associated lines in the vicinity that could cause it. Yes, I randomly get scared and hair stand up on my neck occasionally for no reason. Yes, I see something constantly moving in my peripheral upstairs in the hallway. I sleep with the door open and nightlight on and the hallway is always on. Yes, the barn door to the bonus room was closed one morning after I intentionally left it open. Same in the hallway. Whatever this is, I do fear that it's like a small little demon or something. My wife and I watched some documentary on NASA engineers that got haunted by this little guy in the same room. My son... Seven at the time actually fell asleep in there that night watching some kid movie. I woke him up in the morning and the first thing that he said was, I woke up earlier, I heard little footsteps walk around the bed. I said, oh it must have been the dog. And he replied, no dad, it was the footsteps of a small human. My garage caught on fire twice that week too, which is weird, but anyway... There's a lot more to this, but this definitely captures the essence of what's happening here. I don't know what to do about any of this because, well, it's definitely not my forte. Like I said, I've always been a bit skeptical about this stuff and so I've just never really looked into it. But now that I'm facing it, I would really like some help. Many years ago before cell phones, I, a 20-year-old female then, had driven over to visit my grandmother and was on my way home. She lived in a very nice part of town. I'd only recently got my driver's license and, in my state, you are required to display P-plates in your car windows. The P stands for probationary, but we used to say pick on me or perv magnet plates. In other words, just displaying those plates on your car pretty much guaranteed that you were going to be hassled on the road as a young person. And also, if you drove a small white sedan, you were likely to be female, which was all the more reason to be hassled on the road back then. So, I turned out of my grandmother's street onto the highway. There was no traffic on the highway when I turned onto it, and I had driven no more than 300 meters when... I heard this sudden loud honking right behind me, frightening the heck out of me. I stuck my arm out the window and waved, a circle signal motioning to pass me in case the driver thought that I was going too slow, which I wasn't, mind you. 
The car then pulled out and began driving right next to me. All of a sudden, though, this creepy older looking man in an expensive plain white sedan honked again and was motioning at me to pull over to the side of the road and or to wind down my window. I mouthed no at him. He got more insistent and looked angry as he continued driving right next to me, which is also illegal because he was blocking the entire highway. So creepy man let off a couple more short honks to make me look at him again and flashed his black wallet with some sort of raised metal silver looking crest on it. He was now looking ragingly angry and was pointing at the shield wallet in his hand like he thought that it meant that he was some sort of secret police and had some sort of authority to pull me over. As far as I was concerned, I had not done anything wrong. He was not police. My car was recently serviced, so I knew that there was nothing wrong with it. Which means that there was just no possible reason for this creepy looking guy to pull me over. And I was starting to feel more than a little frightened at this. I decided to brake suddenly so that I could read his car's rear license plate. In case he tried to run me off the road or something. The plate said CDEC. Weird. I had no idea what that meant other than that it was notably odd. In a split second decision though, I chucked an immediately left turn off the highway and drove fast down a few back streets and laneways. This was the area that I had grown up in, walking around with my grandmother, so I knew exactly where I was going. I was so creeped out that I didn't check my rearview mirror though for a couple of turns, so I had no idea if the guy tried to follow me or if he just took off down the highway, but... Either way, in the end, thankfully I lost him. I went to work on the Monday and told the story and one of my older colleagues said to me, that's a consular license plate, which means that the car belongs to a foreign embassy. Intriguing, but I didn't give it much thought. Except, in years later, retelling the tale when I wanted to explain to people why I have a chip on my shoulder when it comes to middle-aged male drivers... I began to realize that there was something very off about it. Fast forward to now when we have YouTube with endless true crime content on tap and I watch cold case and true crime shows. Deep in the YouTube comments of a video about a young woman who vanished without a trace was a comment along the lines of, this sounds similar to a few cold cases around the world where it is suspected that young women have been abducted by someone working for a foreign embassy and diplomatic immunity means that they can move around the world and keep doing what they do with impunity. So, my question is, could that have been what that creepy man was trying to do all those years ago on a beautiful sunny summer day? Abduct me in broad daylight. I would describe myself as an open-minded skeptic. At least, that's what I would have said until maybe about two months ago when I had an experience that forever changed me. Now, I really don't know what to call myself. This happened in early July. I was on a trip with my wife and mother-in-law through the United Kingdom and we had a few days in Edinburgh to take in the sights. Now, I knew that my family was originally from Scotland, but I wasn't sure where. Edinburgh seemed a pretty safe bet though, since that's where JK Rowling is from and my last name, while rather uncommon, is incredibly similar to our minor character in the Harry Potter books. But we had heard that she took inspiration for a number of characters' names from headstones that she found in local kirkyards, cemeteries, so we decided to take a look for ourselves to see if we could find anything. Long story short, we did. Early one evening, we visited St. Cuthbert's Kirkyard near Edinburgh Castle. By random chance, we arrived just as the paranormal bus tour was leaving. The tour group were all lined up by the bus, but the tour guide was walking alone through the Kirkyard to meet them. Clearly not one to miss the opportunity to spook some out-of-towners as we crossed paths, he told us to be on the lookout for the ghost of a little six-year-old. He said that she likes to tug on people's jackets, which we took as an opportunity to make a few predictable jokes to scare each other once we were on our own. 
So we walked around the graveyard for a bit, talking about the various names that we saw, and I made a point to mention that if we did see any of my ancestors, the spelling might be a little bit different. After some time, I felt a small hand hold mine. My wife has pretty small hands, but she was standing on the other side of me, and this also felt smaller, childlike. There was no chill in the air, no eerie feeling that I was being watched, just a small child's hand reaching out and holding onto mine. I didn't say anything out loud because my mother-in-law is very religious and I'm already on thin ice with her over some of my political stances, so it just seemed best to keep my mouth shut about an ongoing paranormal encounter. So there I was, walking through a graveyard with my wife on my left, my mother-in-law behind me, and an invisible child holding my hand as we looked at the tombstones. I was completely silent the whole time. I wasn't afraid, but this ghost seemed friendly almost, and people say that I have kid magic, so I figured, hey, this kid probably just wanted to hold my hand and take a stroll. It wouldn't be so out of ordinary had the child in question been somebody that I knew, and, well, alive, of course, but I digress. I slowed my pace to make it easy for the kid to keep up. I have long legs and people say that I walk fast, which caused me to fall behind a little as my wife went on ahead. My mother-in-law was reading the headstones carefully, causing her to fall even further behind, and I realized that I didn't want to split up our group, so I looked ahead and called out to my wife. I was going to walk over to her, but the hand suddenly pulled back on me. I kept my eyes on my wife and told her to wait up for us and the hand started tugging towards the right side of the path, slightly behind me. It wasn't violent, it felt more like a kid trying to get me to look at something. I was still facing forward when I heard my mother-in-law's voice from behind me on the right side of the path. Is this what you were looking for? I turned around and sure enough, she was standing in front of a large headstone engraved with my family name. About a dozen of my ancestors were directly beneath us in the end, and a ghostly child's hand seemed to be trying to show me that they were there. I paused and took in the experience. It was incredible, and I felt a, a deep sense of gratitude, I guess. After spending some time there, the grip of my hand loosened slightly, but it didn't let go. We continued on our journey, and I found myself swinging my right arm involuntarily to a slightly different rhythm than my own stride. If you've ever held hands with a small child while they're skipping rather than walking, you know what this feels like. After a short walk, though, the swinging stopped, and suddenly I felt my hand released. There was a slight brushing feeling as this spectral hand took leave of my own, and when I looked in the direction that might lead, I saw that I was standing in front of the grave with a girl's name. Apparently, she died at six years old in the early 19th century. For the life of me, I can't remember the name of that headstone, but if I saw it, I would know it right away. And if I ever return to Edinburgh, I'll make sure to bring her flowers to thank her for showing me around. Now, I'm no stranger to odd noise and stuff that I could maybe debunk, or at least stuff that I could convince myself wasn't real, like feeling that I'm being watched, the intense kind of feeling where the hair stands on the back of your neck and you start to slightly panic, or our Alexa suddenly being on volume 10, it's usually on something really low like 2 or 3, and then shouting that it doesn't understand what we're saying when we haven't said anything. Or the fact that at 2am someone knocked on my bedroom door very loudly when both my parents were asleep in the bedroom on the other side of the house, only for me to open my bedroom door and no one be there, even after inspection. But thinking about it now, there would be absolutely no way for either of my parents to sneak out of bed, come to my room and knock on my door, and then make it back into bed in time for me to have come and open the door. I also hear every noise in the house. I know when they open their door and I know when they're using the bathroom. 
I could hear everything, and I didn't really hear anything that night. Still, I pushed it to the back of my mind and told myself that it had to have been one of them, even after telling them about it and them swearing that it wasn't them. But then, about two months ago, I was sat downstairs with my mum watching TV. She paused it so that she could go to the bathroom, so I went to go and make us a cup of tea. She got upstairs and then, maybe about a minute later, as clear as day, I hear her shout my name, so I walk towards the stairs, and she's coming down at the same time. But before I say anything, she asks me if I shouted for her. I told her that no, I didn't and that I thought that she shouted for me. We both thought that it was creepy, but laughed it off, until my mum came into my room tonight and said that my dad, who's extremely skeptical, said that last night after my mum had went to bed, he stayed downstairs to watch a movie, and he had heard what he thought was my mum whisper or shout his name, and that he's absolutely sure that it came from the kitchen. He said that it couldn't have come from anywhere else because the stairs were on the other side of the house. He went into the kitchen and nothing was there apart from an open cupboard. He went upstairs to make sure that my mum was in bed and she was. The door was closed and she was fast asleep. I think it's becoming obvious that there is something with us and it's starting to bother me. I don't think it's a ghost or a spirit... I really don't know what it is, but when I read up about mimics, I was wondering if there's a possibility that this could be one of them. We've lived in this house for 15 years and nothing like this has ever happened, not apart from small stuff that I mentioned earlier. So I really could use some advice, guys. Was this a ghost or a spirit or was it a mimic or is it the same thing? Should I be cautious? Thanks for listening, and I would honestly appreciate anything that you might have to say. This was in 2011, a year after I'd, a female, 22 at the time, had graduated college. I was living in my first apartment with a friend. I had adopted the sweetest dog that I'd ever had, a runt of the litter, Pomeranian, who literally loved every person that she ever met. My nephew, who was young at the time, would sometimes handle her a little bit roughly. Sweet kid, and we'd correct him, but he didn't quite realize how little she was under all that fur, and she tolerated it without ever nipping or anything. One day, though, my roommate was gone and there was a knock at the door. It was a handyman who said that he was there for an annual check on appliances. He was wearing the apartment complex's standard uniform and had a badge, so I didn't really think twice about it. Even though I hadn't been notified that this would be happening, I just went ahead with it anyway. He comes in and begins chatting and sort of, I don't know, like leering. I felt a bit uncomfortable, but not really as freaked out as when my dog came rushing in between us. He is back, teeth bared and started growling at him. He kind of awkwardly laughed and went to pet her. A weird choice for a dog that is baring its teeth at you, and she immediately lunged forward like she was going to bite this guy. He leaped back before she could bite him. Tiny dog, large man, but he was obviously freaked out by her. At this point, she is straight up barking at this guy. He asked if I could put her away while he worked, and... I lied and said that she had separation anxiety, so I recommended that he come back another time when I could walk her, or when my roommate was there so one of us could be in the room with her. And so he left, but strangely, he never did come back. My dog lived another seven years, and not once did she ever growl at any other human, let alone try to bite one. You hear about dogs being able to read people, so... While I didn't know if he would have done anything to me while on company hours, I still think that she could sense that he wasn't a good person. In any case, I'm glad that she was there that day, and it is strange that he never did come back. When I was 10, I'm 36 now, 
my mother, 31, aunt, 28, almost three months pregnant, and sister, 5, and myself were Christmas shopping in a town about 45 minutes from my home. My father, Southern Baptist preacher at the time, always made my mum call him on a payphone before we would leave the town that we were in to head home. So my mother did so right around 9pm when the mall that we were at was closing. After hitting up a drive through for drinks and snacks, we began our drive home. We would take a route home that consisted almost entirely of back roads, roads with farmland on either side, occasional forests or farm homes. We are driving along a patch of road with farmland on our left that has a small patch of forestry behind it. As we close the distance between us and the mini forest, one of the adults says, it looks like those trees over there are on fire. I look and the wooded area is glowing a fiery orange. We're all looking in that direction of the trees, directly to our left now, when a brilliant white light, akin to semi-truck brights, floods our car and the source appears to be directly in front of us on the road. If you've ever passed out, you'll know what I mean when I say it's different from waking up. You're just sort of aware again or something. Anyway... It was like that for me. I opened my eyes to my mum and aunt wordlessly staring at each other. I looked around the car to see the windows are sort of lightly frosted over and my exhales are visible in the super cold car. My sister is just sitting there staring at the back of the seat in front of her. My aunt says to my mum, guess we can't get that loaf of bread you needed. To which my mum says nothing but instead starts up the car. We are in a small town now, about 15 minutes away from home, but not along our route home, in a mum and pop grocery store parking lot called Harvest Market. Also, it is now 2.30 a.m. I'm aware that this should be impossible, but we finish our journey home to be greeted by the police cruisers in our driveway. My dad had called the police when we hadn't made it home at the expected time. A state officer drove our route home that we would have taken, worried that we were off the road somewhere. My father was furious, especially when my mother kept telling him that she didn't know where we were. She was crying and super scared. The officer at our house was really glad that we were home and they left. My family was, at the time, very religious, so our five hours of lost time was just swept under the rug because there was no explanation that aligned with our perspectives. My aunt unfortunately lost the baby without any indications that a miscarriage had occurred and the OB doc told her that the fetus must have reabsorbed itself into her body. I had night terrors for years afterwards too, would wake up drenched in sweat, unable to recall what it was in my dreams that had me so scared. Thankfully, I've since gotten over that. Now, I'm not claiming to have been abducted, but... I can say with certainty that all four of us lost five hours and my cousin just wasn't in my aunt's uterus anymore either. I've kicked around the idea of regression therapy but I don't know if I trust it would work and if it did work, I don't know if I want to know what happened to be honest. I've shared this story in my 10th grade public speaking class. Please don't dox me if you know who I am. And my English teacher told me after class that she believed me and it made me cry. I didn't think that I'd ever be able to talk about it outside of my family and best friends, but she really empowered me to talk about it. The truth rings true and people recognize it when they hear it. It was my litmus test for my current partner of almost 12 years. I told him what happened a few months into us dating and he believed me. Not that I need to be believed, but it is validating. So, who the heck knows what happened, but the event dramatically changed my perspective, and I've been on the hunt for the truth ever since. If anyone has any ideas as to how I could go about finding out what happened, I'm more than happy to hear your suggestions. I've attempted to undergo hypnosis before, not for this particular situation, just in general, and unfortunately it was unsuccessful. It very well could have been the hypnotist wasn't all that effective, or... I just wasn't in the right mindset at the time, but I'm definitely open to trying again if anyone knows of someone who could help. Anyway, happy hunting fellow seekers and stay safe out there.
One night after a student party, my mate and I decided to bike up a mountain to where the city had installed hammocks so we could watch the sunrise. It was at times a steep incline and we only had our bike lights to guide us. My friend was in better shape than I, got well ahead of me. Halfway towards our destination, we then heard a rustling come from the hill to the right. And before I knew what was happening, my friend had turned his bike around and started pedaling fast. Right at that moment, a rugged guy with long hair and a beard ran down the hill and tried to lunge for my bike. He near managed to grab the handlebars, but I turned around just in time to follow my mate and started pedaling as quickly as I could. Let me tell you though, flying down a mountain in the pitch dark with a terrible bike light with someone running after you screaming is legitimately terrifying. He ran all the way to the entrance of the forest and he stood there watching a cycle away. It was really creepy and the whole thing just felt really off. Almost like it was planned. So a few years ago, I lived in an apartment complex in San Antonio, Texas. I, 26-year-old female, lived there for about four years with a couple of my best friends. Over the years, I would run in a neighborhood that was close to our apartment complex I've actually had a couple of weird things happen to me throughout the years running through there, as well as at our complex, but this event was definitely the most terrifying moment in my life and caused me to stop running in that neighborhood altogether until life finally found my friends and I moving to a different city. So over the years of running in that neighborhood, I became familiar with this one house that gave serious trap house vibes. It was very out of place for the neighborhood as there was an elementary school just up the street, and the area is not a high crime area by any means. It was a corner house that was at the first stop sign of my running path, so closest to my apartment, and housed a, a group of about six huge men. That's usually about how many I would see together at a time anyway, and they always had people coming and going. Sounded like they threw a never-ending party, and their property smelled strongly of weed. As a woman and avid watcher of crime documentaries, I'm constantly paranoid and observant of my surroundings, which is why I'd come to know that house so well. Throughout the years, I'd always managed to see them, but they never saw me. But the last year we lived there, that all changed. So just so you guys know, it wasn't dark at all during this event. The sun was out and shining brightly, and it was about 5.30pm or so. I'm at the start of my path and I'm coming up to that first stop sign in the house. Per usual, I look for them in their vehicle and any potential traffic and I see that they aren't home. They only had one vehicle that they would all pile into and it was a big black Tahoe or something. I'm not a car expert by any means but that's just my guess. I continue on my run though which takes me further up past that house and into another neighborhood where I would run around in a cul-de-sac a few times before running back down that path. I'd say maybe about an hour and a half passes by and then I decided to head home after the sun starts to set and it gets dark. As I'm running home and coming up to that house and the stop sign, I'm listening to music and running and see that I'll need to stop at the stop sign because of traffic. I'm coming up to the stop sign which puts the house to the right of me and the stop sign to the four-way intersection to the left of me and I credit what happened next to trusting my instincts, remaining observant and being in band and softball. I was honestly really tired from my run so I was kind of looking down at the ground rather than ahead but I always utilize my peripheral vision. Shout out to being a band nerd, if you know then you know. So I take off to run across the street to the sidewalk that will take me to the fence on the side of my apartment complex. It didn't have a door so I would just either hop it or slide under to run down that path. And I see that the vehicle that had been stopped at the stop sign perpendicular to me is the vehicle that I know to belong to the house that was just on the right of me. Out of the corner of my eye I see them turn like as if they're going to go down their street when I think... Huh, that turn seemed too wide, like a U-turn, which is weird since their house is right there. I take all of two tired steps. I was out of energy at this point. 
before, I just get this sinking gut feeling. Now, I have never in my life felt this feeling before, but immediately I felt danger at my back and everything in my body and mind told me to run for my life. So, I did. With that feeling of fear in my stomach and danger at my back, I sprinted down the sidewalk with renewed vigor and slid under the fence like I was sliding to home plate. I immediately popped out and turned around to look outside the fence where I had just been and that was when I saw them. The group of men that I'd only ever seen in passing were sitting in their car on the street outside of my apartment complex fence with their windows down and all six of them were just staring at me with predatory eyes. We stared at each other for what seemed like a long time before I watched them drive away and once they were out of sight, I ran to my apartment and locked myself in there, scared to show them exactly where my apartment was as I was worried that they were circling the complex looking for me. I told my friends what happened and spent the rest of the night full of adrenaline, pacing and reflecting on what had just happened, whether or not these guys knew where I lived. Those men purposely chose not to go home, but pulled a U-turn to follow behind me as I was running away. Recounting the story over the years, I've had people tell me that it was just so that they could view my butt as I ran or something. But when I remember that feeling in my body that was almost a voice in my head yelling at me to run like my life depended on it. And I think of their blank faces and dark eyes staring at me from inside that vehicle. I seriously question what their true intentions were that day. Several years ago, I walked a handful of blocks up the street from my partner's house to a convenience store to buy something to drink. It was about 11pm and I was trying to slide in there before the store closed. To set the scene too, we lived in a, a transitory neighborhood that was chock full of abandoned houses and crime with a few occupied residences and businesses scattered about. There were zero street lights or illumination of any sort. Envision a, a more compact version of the type of Detroit neighborhood exemplified in the movie Barbarian and you won't be far off the mark. Looking back, the nighttime excursions to the store from my place to his were absolutely idiotic on my part, but after living in that environment for years, I guess you just become accustomed to it. Anyway, it was one of my many foolhardy nighttime store trips. My partner by then would ask me not to do it, but I just ignored that. I mean, I wanted my drink after all. Really dumb of me, I know. I got the few blocks up the street in the usual darkness, got my drink, and left the store to head back. Outside the store, a guy was standing near the trash can hassling everyone who came out, asking for money, cigarettes, etc. I told him that I didn't have anything and started to cross the parking lot and head back, but this guy sprang after me like a freaking rabbit and grabbed a hold of my arm. He starts aggressively demanding that I go to a party with him, and trying to steer me down this pitch black side street just beside the convenience store. He was probably 6'7", crazy tall and super thin, with dreads all in his face, making it hard to even see what he looked like. His fingers though bit into my arm and felt like they pinched a nerve. My heart starts pounding like crazy right away. I was used to brushing off this type of behavior, having lived in that neighborhood for several years by then. But this, this was way more aggressive than anything that I had faced so far. I shook my arm out of his grasp, told him that I was heading to my boyfriend's place, and it was only a few blocks down the street. He was waiting for me. I said sorry in an attempt to placate him, and I took off speed walking down the street at top speed. He called after me several times, and then I heard his quick footsteps as... He apparently decided to follow me down the street. By then I could feel my heartbeat in my eyeballs. My mouth had gotten cotton dry and I was almost hyperventilating with fear, trying to stay quiet so this guy wouldn't hear me. I had this feeling that to show fear or to look back at him would cause him to react violently right away. So I just put on a burst of speed and tried to outwalk him. 
however. My fire five legs were no match for his crazy long stride, and I could hear little pieces of rock and concrete crunching under his feet as he closed in on me. I literally felt like my heart would leap out of my chest or explode from fear. I tried to walk even faster, but I could hear the guy right behind me now. I could hear his breath in my ear and got this overwhelming feeling that he was going to grab me at any second, maybe even with a weapon, and try to force me to walk wherever he wanted me to go. The neighborhood is pitch black and there's no real through traffic, not at night. If he wanted to force me to go with him, I would be powerless, save for trying to run from him, but with his height advantage, I knew that he'd catch me quickly. Then, I could finally see my boyfriend's driveway, and him standing at the end of it, waiting for me. He had a terrible feeling that night, and already worried constantly about me walking at night, so he'd come outside to wait for me. I saw that he had his crowbar in one hand, his usual defense weapon kept me in the front door, and then my nerve broke, and I started sprinting toward him, and the tall dude behind me started to run after me. I reached the place where my boyfriend stood and squeaked out help, or something like that, dove behind him and cowered, waiting for the tall dude to pull a gun out and shoot us both or start struggling with my boyfriend. But it didn't happen. Instead, he gets right up in my boyfriend's face, standing way too close to him, and then just asks for a light. My boyfriend gives him one, holding the crowbar aloft in the other hand so that it was very visible. Then I grab a hold of him and yank him into the house, locking the door and absolutely losing it, sobbing and freaking out while trying to choke out what happened. My boyfriend goes looking from the windows and sees him kind of standing around and eventually then leaving. He saw him here and there for months afterward too, up at the store or walking up and down the street right outside of our place. Unsurprisingly, I'm sure, I never took another nighttime walk. And to this day, I still sometimes have nightmares about it. So I'm lucky enough to work in a Tudor Hall in the UK. The building is late 14th century, although much of it is late 16th century and later. It's timber framed and the electrics are in dire need of doing so. It has a sort of creaky and poorly lit old pile. Places like this tend to accumulate spooky stories and the hall is no exception with two old legends in particular. There have been loads of sightings around this place that have been reported by both staff and visitors. In the seven years that I've been there, I've been collecting those stories, and we've even made a ghost tour from them. I'm somewhat of a skeptic myself, but I have had three experiences that I just cannot really explain. I will now share two of them. So the first came in the summer of 2018. It was still bright out, so the hall wasn't too dark. I was closing the first floor of the house up on my own. I reached the room where a lot of the sightings centered around. Off to the side is a bedroom with a large oak door. I had my back to the main room whilst trying to close the door as the bolt was jammed. As I was doing this, a massive crash happened right behind me. I spun around in alarm expecting to see the suit of armor on the floor, but the room was deathly still. I could feel the vibrations through the doorknob, but needless to say, I was freaked out and I just left. The second experience was quite fleeting, but I'm sure of what I saw. Again, at the end of the day, about six months after the first experience, in the service wing, there's a sort of large Victorian kitchen, and just outside of its door is a small staircase leading up to the servants' quarters and a guest wing. I was heading into the kitchen to turn the lights off, but I looked up the stairs as I passed, and I saw someone in a long white dress pass across the top. It took me a moment as we had other staff in, but I realized that the last visitors had just left. Thinking that we must have missed someone, I went up the stairs and searched for this visitor. I looked through several rooms. In fact, I looked everywhere, but there was nobody there. Needless to say, 
it's a spooky old place and many of the staff don't like being there on their own. If I can figure out an easier way to share the other stories, I will, but for now, this will have to do. This happened in 2017. I was hanging out under a bridge with my friends when I was in high school. It was near my house and it had really cool graffiti, so we used to go there to take pics and just sort of hang out. Once, we decided to go at night and we were sitting on the far left of the ledge. Anyway, we were just talking about random things and to the far right I saw the shadow figure of a man. Whoever it was, he was sitting on the edge of the ledge just hanging out. I thought that I was tripping at first so I kept looking but every time I looked back he was still there and it was then that I realized that the shadow wasn't really a, a shadow from a person but the shadow was a person. I was convinced still that it was my mind playing tricks on me but later on in the conversation we started talking about the paranormal and my friend mentioned how this place was really creepy at night. I then mentioned how I thought that I kept seeing this figure over there. She was like, bro, I see it too. I was convinced that she was playing with me, so I didn't believe her at first. But she insisted that she saw it too and thought that she was tripping as well. I was like, you know what, I'm good, I'm out of here. I start walking by myself and praying. She was with her boyfriend and they had an electric scooter that they were going to ride on so I was like let me get a head start because there was no way that I was going to wait for them in that place alone. I eventually went home and after that I never went back there again at night. These days this story is a bit of a laugh for us. I'm no longer afraid of these types of things because I know now to protect myself against them religiously. Back then I was much more afraid but to this day... I swear that I know what I saw. There was a shadow man sitting there under that bridge. I, a 25 year old female, have always been more in tune with the supernatural and my first memorable experience I just so happened to witness with my cousin. When we were much, much younger, my cousin, her name is Kay, and I went to a birthday party for one of our older cousins. Her name was Kat. It was a gorgeous day in June, and it was the perfect day to enjoy a nice summer breeze. My cousin Kat was having her party for her 12th birthday at the Duncan Park. While this park had its usual picnic tables and playground equipment, it was surrounded by weeping willows, which aren't that uncommon to find in this part of Mississippi. However, unlike other parks, this one was sitting right next to an old plantation house, an abandoned YMCA that closed down in the 70s, and the front of an old locomotive that the city was forced to fence off because my aunt had defaced it in her youth. My cousin Kay and I ran around the park while waiting for the rest of our family to show up and enjoy the festivities. That was when we saw them, two women dressed up in pastel lacy dresses with bell skirts and bonnets. The style resembled that of the Civil War era. However, in our seven and eight year old brains, they were dressed like Barbie princesses. So we followed as we still had that child naivety when it came to stranger danger. They walked up the steps to the front porch of the Greek revival style home where we saw a few men in tailcoats adorned with top hats and what looked to be afternoon tea set up on a table. My cousin and I watched at a distance at first, completely entranced by the scene in front of us. It was honestly almost like something out of a fairy tale. We got a bit closer and I remember we were going to ask them something. What were we going to ask though? I don't remember. But I do remember that as soon as the word hey came out of our mouths... The ladies in dresses and the gentlemen in suits stopped what they were doing and then floated through the walls of the house, disappearing completely. My cousin and I stood there and looked at each other for a few minutes in disbelief at what we had just witnessed. Kay and I came to a silent understanding that no one would believe us since we were just children and would be written off as having overactive imaginations. 
We went back to Kat's party like everything was normal and didn't utter a word of what had just happened to, well, anyone. Fast forward to when we were teens, we finally told my mum what we had experienced all those years ago. My mum told us that the Auburn plantation had reenactments in the spring, so what we must have seen was former residents enjoying the summer breeze like they were still amongst the living. My cousin and I, we know what we saw that day, and it was not a reenactment. When I was in college, I was out and about with my then boyfriend. We had gone to dinner, then went to Walmart to get some typical college food so that we could survive a Sunday in. I was dressed up in a casual dressy fit, and we decided to split up while we shopped split apart, maybe to do quicker shopping, but I don't remember the exact reason why. I just remember that I was wandering the grocery aisles when I noticed this girl who was about my age. In a friendly manner, we casually smile at each other and continued on shopping. It didn't seem weird at first, but I kept noticing her in the same aisles as me, and a big muscular man was never far behind us. Eventually, I texted my boyfriend and asked where he was and continued on shopping. Next thing I know, the girl approaches me and says that she loves my jacket. I say, thanks, Maurice's, and try to move on. She stops me and says something along the lines of, hey, you look like you're my age and seem really nice. I just moved here for a new job and company my friends and I are starting up and tried to ask me questions about where I was from. I was vague and untrusting with what I said, noticing that this wasn't really that normal. Then she said, I'm looking for more people like you and I too work for our company. It's kind of a warehouse job and I would love for you to be on one of our bookkeepers. You should give me your number. I said, that's really nice of you to offer me a job, but I'm not a desk person and already have a job that I love. She said, that's a bummer. I thought we might work well together. Well, would you want to give me your number so that we can hang out? I would love to have a friend who can show me around the city. It was then that I realized that I wasn't getting out of this situation until my boyfriend showed up or I gave her my number. Eventually, I rattled off a fake phone number and said, hey, I'll catch you later. I gotta go. Then I walked away, praying my boyfriend would be near so that we could get out of there quickly. While I was looking for him and trying to call him, the girl called up to me and said, I tried to call you, but it said the number was out of service. And as I tried to come up with a quick excuse and say, maybe you typed it in wrong, she saw that my phone was unlocked and in my hand. She quickly snatched it and called herself on it. I was so flustered and mad at her that I snatched my phone back right when my boyfriend came around the corner. He instantly recognized that something was up and said that we had to go. When the girl saw him approach me, she looked really disappointed to see him and stopped trying to interact with me. We ended up buying nothing and leaving. That night, we called our parents and the police too. The police said that they didn't think there was anything in it or anything ill-intended, but I was sure that it was probably trafficking. I was going to switch my phone number because I was actually a little bit scared. I blocked them though and turned off all location access on my phone. I was too scared to go anywhere alone for a little while too. I even told my coach so that she knew. Anyway, a, a couple of days later I got a text from a random number. It was the girl. She sent a picture of my best friend who was out drinking downtown with some of her other friends. The text said, I met your best friend. She gave me your number because I told her that I was looking for a new friend. She showed me a picture of you and I said, what a coincidence. I met her the other day and lost her number when I got a new phone. About two minutes later, I got a text from my best friend that said, I gave your number to a girl who wants to make friends around here and is looking for people to join her business. And since I moved this week, I thought of you. I freaked out a bit at this and I told her that she needed to get away from this girl and not to leave alone with her. I stayed up worried until my best friend got home. She said that she was fine, otherwise I would have gone to pick her up. The next day, my best friend apologized and told me to block the number. My friend and her group tried to ditch her, but she kept showing up at the bars that they were at. 
which was weird because how did she know that they were there? She said the girl was relentless and texted her all night, trying to get my friend to hang out at her place. My best friend also said that when she asked about the business, the girl wouldn't give her many details, other than that it was a, a warehouse somewhere, would pay her great, in town, and if she wanted a tour of it, she would take her. Weirdly too, after this, we never actually heard from this girl again. It was as if she just fell off the radar completely. Anyway, today I was listening to a podcast and they mentioned different sex trafficking tactics. Two were actually vague jobs where they would pay you well but needed you to come meet them to give you more information. And also a new to town girl who desperately needs new friends. I've been thinking about this all morning and I'm really glad that I felt uncomfortable and that my friend didn't go with this girl as well. But I'm mostly mad that the cops ignored my concern and said that it was nothing. I at least hoped that they wrote down the tip that night. I mean, I doubt they did, but honestly, it was really creepy vibes just all around. And the fact that she disappeared like that, I don't know, the whole thing was really fishy. This morning I woke up at my usual time, 5am, to go to the gym before classes. I'm off campus staying with my parents, however they're away for the month so I've had the house to myself. And well, every morning I wake up, let my dog out to go and do his morning business, shower, brush my teeth and let him back inside before I get dressed and leave. This morning I woke up feeling a little bit weird. The house sort of had a bit of a strange energy to it, I guess, and my gut sensed that something was up. I let our dog out into our pitch black backyard. The deck light didn't turn on like it usually does, which was a bit unusual, but I didn't think too much of it and went to go and take a shower. After my shower, I went back to the sliding glass door to my dog to let him in, and I could see him sitting there waiting for me. I opened the door and watched him, a large black lab, walk in and go under a table. I then proceeded to close the door and walk to my room to get dressed. But here's where it gets weird. You see, as I'm leaving the area where the back door is, I felt that same strange feeling that I had been feeling all morning. I decided to look at the dog bed and noticed that he wasn't in it, so I looked back at the door and saw to my utter confusion that he was still sitting outside. My stomach instantly dropped. I mean, I could have sworn on my life that I watched him come in the house and go under a table. I walked back to the door, let my actual dog inside this time, and instantly searched my house to see if another animal came inside at some point, and I didn't find anything. As I thought more about it though, the thing that I let in before looked more like a, a shadow rather than a dog, I guess, and it sort of moved differently too, although it was around the same size. I called my girlfriend to tell her about it as she was waiting for me at the gym, and she said that it was probably just my imagination, but I have never, ever imagined something this real. I wasn't even tired too, and I definitely saw it. I noticed that my dog was acting a little strange too, staring at one of our walls and growling quietly as well. In any case, I left soon after and I got on with my day. I must admit though that I am a bit at a, a loss as to what to do. If anyone has a possible explanation to ease my nerves or knows what I should do next, then I would love to know because I'm really dreading sleeping there alone tonight. A couple of days ago, I was walking my dog around the lake at my condominium like I always do. It was around 6.30pm and the sky was getting a little bit dark. But my dog is a golden retriever and she's very friendly with people and other dogs too. She's six months old and she rarely barks or growls at anybody. She actually loves being petted by strangers in fact. But she's usually very calm too regardless of if people pet her or not. Anyway... 
We were walking and suddenly I turned around and I saw this guy coming out of nowhere. The guy looked a little bit odd. He had glasses and he sort of seemed to be walking nervously. He was still far away from us so I didn't think that he was nervous about my dog or anything. As he got closer to us though I just sort of stopped and moved to the side like I usually do when there is somebody coming from behind us. I do this so that they can walk ahead of us and my dog stops constantly looking back moving its tail looking forward to being pet but instead my dog just sort of starts getting I don't know like restless and also starts growling nervously while looking at this guy. I tried to calm her down and I smiled at the guy trying to be friendly but the guy just sort of looked at me with a, a really serious face and started reaching for something out of his backpack. At this point, my dog just starts barking and I get this bad feeling and a shiver goes down my spine. For a second, I thought, what if the guy had a weapon or something? The guy just kept walking, looking at me while reaching for something in his backpack. As my dog kept barking at him, I apologized for my dog's behavior and tried to tell him that my dog usually doesn't behave like that. But the guy just seemed to ignore me altogether. Finally, he just passes us and my dog starts barking again, but she's still really agitated. I just sat down next to her trying to calm her down while the guy just got lost between some of the houses at one point instead of just walking the lake path, which seemed very weird to me. Now, maybe I was just being paranoid. Maybe the guy just didn't like dogs, which is fine, I guess. I try to be really respectful to people who don't like dogs. But after he got lost from our sight, my dog just went back to her usual friendly self. And we were able to finish our walk. But, I don't know, something felt really off about this guy. And the encounter altogether made me feel really uncomfortable. To preface this, I've dealt with sleep paralysis, night terrors, and shadow people since I was a child. I think it all started when maybe I was around 9 or 10, and it got worse as I entered my teenage years. Granted, I was dealing with a lot of abuse and childhood trauma at the time, so when they stopped after I moved out at 19, I just chalked it all up to stress. Flash forward to the present though, I've moved into this new apartment a couple of states over from my hometown almost four months ago now. But things have felt really good here too. I live with my roommate or best friend, 28 year old female, and her two cats and her dog. But I felt the vibes were kind of off sometime last week and I smudged the house and kept all the windows open to help air out the negative energy and bring in some more positive energy. Later that night, my roommate confessed to me that she'd been seeing shadow people in the hallway at night, and that the night before, one came up and actually touched her door handle. We keep her door propped open for the cats to run in and out, otherwise they scream. I assured her though that I felt something was off too, and I already cleansed the house. We had no problems the rest of the week, and she still hasn't seen any shadow people since then. However... Friday night, I went to bed as normal, had no problems falling asleep. My room stays pretty illuminated with a bright blue light that comes from the speakers on my PC, but the light never shuts off on the speakers, even when my PC is off, so I can see everything really well in my room at night. And at some point, I woke up from a dream and I saw what I can only describe as a demonic woman. She sort of looked like the girl from the ring, but in what looked like, I don't know, aeroplane stewardess clothes? The best way that I can think to describe it. She was in my open closet though, on my clothes like a rock climber, and she sort of tilted her head so far back that her face was upside down and facing me. She had a long tongue and she was moving her head all around and shaking it like crazy. I couldn't move. I tried to reach for my phone to call my roommate to wake her up or bang on the wall behind me, the opposite side of her room. So I was just stuck there laying there and watching this weird demon lady on my clothes in my closet. I was able to rationalize and tell myself that it's all a dream over and over again to try and wake myself up out of it. 
I finally woke up as I was trying to yell for help, but it kept coming out as a, a sort of whisper. I finally jumped out of bed in my empty room, and after looking around, she was gone. I was able to fall almost right back asleep after shaking off the whole experience, but I went ahead and cleansed my room again Saturday morning and spent some extra time on that closet as well. I mean, I've had sleep paralysis before, but this, this felt a bit different. I slept fine Saturday night, and last night the room felt good. Now, I haven't had any stress or have had anything happen that would trigger these again. It would suck if I moved several states away from home and straight into a haunted apartment. But if you have any thoughts and ideas on what I can do, that would be much appreciated. My girlfriend told me like two weeks ago that she was waiting in line at the convenience store with her friend in Chinatown, New York City. And this large, dapper looking man came over to them. Apparently he complimented her coat and commented how expensive it must be. She said thank you and they chatted for a little longer. The man explained how his suit was just a, a Brooks Brothers suit but she noticed that he had all sorts of expensive jewelry on. When my girlfriend and her friend explained that they were students, he kept making assumptions about how they must be rich and that their parents are paying for everything. My girlfriend was starting to feel uncomfortable and began trying to distance herself from him. He asked them if they had jobs and they told him no, as they were students. After this, he went on to tell them what he does for a living, without being asked, mind you, and he said, I do all sorts of odd jobs, this and that. I mainly have these guys that work for me though. I find them off the streets and feed them and give them a place to stay. I'm waiting to meet up with them now. He referred to them as his minions, which made something that at first seemed wholesome, very unsettling all of a sudden. He then told them that he had just had his wallet stolen and needed $400 for something. I don't remember the reason. He told them that he could pay them back later that week, but he needed the money right now. My girlfriend politely declined and at this point was really uncomfortable. She started walking towards the door to leave and said, nice to meet you and good luck. They both walked outside and sat on a bench outside of the convenience store. As they were sitting and discussing the strange interaction, they saw the man exit and stand outside about 10 feet away, waiting for a few minutes, looking at his phone. He then met up with two other men and they chatted for a few minutes. The large man in the suit then walked the other direction and the two other men then walked into the store and started holding it up with knives. Absolutely shocked and frozen, they both watched as the cashier put her hands up, then emptied out the cash register. The two men ran out of the store in the same direction as the man in the suit walked. We were both about to call the police but saw that the cashier already was. They waited at the bench until the two police cars showed up and then they walked in to tell the officers what they had just witnessed and tried to help identify the robbers and the man that they had just met. I wonder though if this is a common thing in terms of organized crime because to me it looked like this guy had paid homeless people to rob and commit this crime. So this happened to me quite recently. For practical and economic reasons, I used the taxi service, the fixed price, which cost me less than taking my vehicle, especially given the place where I live, as it's an ultra-rural village isolated from all cities, and where necessarily to go to the bank or go shopping, you have to hit like 10 to 20 kilometers. In general, the taxi service I use is ultra-professional, recent vehicles, clean, maintained, friendly driver, Always a friendly random conversation, always on time, and almost always the same drivers too. But one day, three or four weeks ago, I was entitled to a new driver, which was nothing special I suppose. It seemed like the same impeccable service, nothing to complain about really. But two weeks ago, this gentleman who already told me to call him by his first name, gave me his age, his nationality, information that came out of nowhere 
and continued his conversations by explaining that he bought a, a connected printer but can't get it to be recognized by his smartphone. So I try to give him some advice and it sort of stops there. Again though, this driver has a, a really enthusiastic mood. A little bit too much for my taste, so I don't pay attention to it. He keeps talking to me about his printer again and blurts out to me, You who work in this field, you can help me. I, I can't. It's not connected. If you want, we can add ourselves on Messenger and you can help me. Since we had arrived at my destination, I stammered out an answer, something like, I'll think about it later. But I knew that I needed to not talk to this guy about my work because I'm actually a computer technician, among some other things, so it would be obvious that he could get my number for this. In the end, though, I ended up forgetting about this moment since I had to help a friend. I was mired in a complicated divorce situation where there was domestic violence and stuff. Suffice it to say that this divorce worried me a lot and that this moment with the taxi, I just ended up forgetting about it because of all this. Except that I had to move and I necessarily called the taxi again. And after barely getting in, a sudden urge to get out of the vehicle came over me all of a sudden. He says hello to me, but using my first name, asks me for news about my father's health and some more playful humor, I guess. I specify that once again I never mention my first name, nor mention my father to this driver. Suffice it to say, though, that after this, we sort of drove in silence. In any case, I do what I have to do, and in the store parking lot, I call the taxi center to order a taxi for the return. The gentleman replies that there is already a vehicle that has dropped off an old lady that I have to meet her and notify her instantly that she can pick me up. I arrived at the level of the driver and, again, it was this same driver with a big smile. He helps me by putting my bags in the trunk and at this point, he sort of gives me a tactile gesture on my back. A kind of, I don't know, it felt like a bit of caressing almost. Whatever it was though, it made my blood run cold. The driver though asks me to get in the front because the rear doors have a problem unlocking or something. And it was at this point that I honestly almost backed out of this. I get in the front though, telling myself, 10 kilometers by car, it will go quickly, and I tried to hide my emotions. But that was a mistake. This ultra-curious guy was talking to me, asking me a ton of questions, and it almost seemed like he was trying to, I don't know, direct my answers. The questions were very focused on explicit content though, increasingly scandalous, not to say that things got very direct after a while too. He would insist upon things like, when I finish, you must compliment me. Have you ever tried the Moroccan cigar? And always with a really awkward smile, touching the limits of my crotch, tactile movements in my direction while I was limiting sticking to the door. He was trying to hold my wrist though as I was attempting to fix my hand over the central locking button. The doors which had no problems in the end, since the onboard computer didn't indicate any warnings. They were accessible and I genuinely thought about just jumping out at one point. And of course, instead of taking the shortest route, he took the longest which reduces the time of the route from 10 to 15 minutes to almost 50 minutes. It was also in an ultra-isolated wooded area, which obviously didn't help. In the end, I just tried to maintain my composure. I responded vaguely to his comments or tried to make little jokes, hiding my growing anxiety. I don't know and I don't really want to know what this guy was up to, but... I arrived at my place, I took all of my bags in one foul swoop and I just got the heck out of there. At home in the hour that followed, the driver spoke to me on WhatsApp too. I blocked him directly after that and I didn't read any more. But after calming down, I contacted the taxi company or I explained the situation and the guy on the phone just answered me with, are you talking about so and so? I answered in the affirmative. And then he answered me in a, a really weird way, almost in a very, I don't know, like mafia intonation. 
I have no other images in mind to describe it, but it was like, don't worry, we'll take care of it. So on the one hand, I said to myself, I may not have been the first person that this guy tried it on, which is scary, and also that this will take care of it. I don't know. After this, I think I'm going to use another taxi service. This whole situation is still spinning in my head, and to be honest, I'm still processing it all, and I don't know what to think. Every time that I think about this story, my brain just breaks. It was 2014. My girlfriend at the time and I went on an impromptu camping trip up in Northern California. I'm not quite exactly sure where, but we lived in Sacramento and drove about four or five hours up I-5. We were up in the hills and drove down some pretty sketchy roads. Once we found a spot, we parked our car and hiked maybe half a mile in, truly in the middle of nowhere. We set up our tent and made a small fire pit about 25 yards away, I would guess. The day was fine too. We hung out and did camping things and when it was time for us to go to bed, we put out the fire, got in the tent, zipped it up and we went to sleep. But this, this is where it gets really weird. You see, the girl woke me up at about uh, maybe midnight to tell me that she was going to find a place to pee but she was struggling to get out of the tent. I can't find the zipper, she says. It's just gone. So I get up to help her, and as I feel around the walls, they're completely smooth. I grab the flashlight, and then I turned it on to investigate, and it was then that we found out that the zipper was actually under us. All of our stuff was still in order as we left it, but we were now sleeping on the door of the tent. We rolled the tent to finally get out, and when we finally do, we find that we are right next to the fire pit that we built 25 yards out. We were so terrified and confused because there was just no way that we could have slept through both of us rolling a tent that far with all of our stuff staying in its place like that. We stayed up until the sun came back up, and after that we left right away. I still have zero explanation as to what happened that night. I entertain some pretty out there thoughts, but this one is one that will sit with me forever as the strangest thing that has ever happened to me in my life. Almost a year ago, I was an opener at a resort clocking in before 5am each day. The resort is located inside of an affluent neighborhood in a very wealthy town or suburb. Employees had to park in one of two parking lots at either ends of the property, and the lot that I chose was adjacent to a long and windy road outside the resort, which led to the rest of the neighborhood. The road and the resort were separated by a short range of brush and trees that no one ever walked through. So I'd arrived one morning, per usual, and put the car into park and my headlights still on. The lights in the lot weren't ever on in the morning since nobody else really showed up before 6am when the sun was out, so it was usually always dark at the start of my walk. Save for the security as well, I was one of the first employees to arrive on the property each morning, and was usually completely alone in this particular parking lot at this time. This morning didn't seem any different either. I had my hand literally at my keys, my brain in the process to turn off my car, when all of a sudden I noticed a young girl, maybe like 14 or 15 years old, come sort of scampering. Her body language was the exact definition, run with quick light steps, especially through sort of fear or excitement, through the span of the trees that separate the resort from the outside road. She was directly in front of the car, and my headlights illuminated a clear view of her in the pitch black. She looked like she was maybe in high school, had long blonde hair and was wearing a jacket with pajamas maybe, like she just walked out of a house perhaps. One thing about her that bothered me though was that she wouldn't stop laughing and smiling. I couldn't hear her laughing from outside the car obviously, but she was visually giggling or something and I wasn't aware of or could see what she was laughing at and it was really unnatural. She occasionally glanced behind her too as if 
somebody else was waiting there away from the headlights maybe? She then waved at me like it was a normal gesture at this time and then immediately ran to my passenger side door. This all happened in a matter of seconds and I wasn't really sure what was even happening besides my anxiety spiking at first. I know that I simultaneously sort of yanked the auxiliary cord from my phone to shut whatever song had been playing off while grabbing for the lock button. I remember feeling panic for never remembering if it's up or down to lock when the girl began pulling violently and incessantly on the door handle on the passenger side. I realized then too that because I didn't turn my car off, it had stayed locked. She began pounding on the window though and I was screaming at the top of my lungs for her to leave before pressing on my horn. I could see her laughing outside like this was a, some type of game, as if I were a silly friend not letting her in as a joke. After a few seconds, she stopped the pounding and trying to open my car door. Her face fell flat like I had disappointed her, and she started to walk away from my car back the way that she came. She waved at me again before squeezing through the trees, out of view of my headlights. The whole encounter confused me almost as much as it scared me. Most people that I've told the story to just chalked it up to her being on drugs, but that narrative hasn't felt right to me despite her behavior. Maybe she was just being an extremely out-of-touch teenager whose parents need a firmer grip on her. My first thought was possibly human trafficking, but I'm not sure if that would fit this scenario as I'm not the most well-versed with the subject. I told someone when I made it to LP, but they didn't seem to care much. I didn't call the police, and I regret that. I'll never get it out of my brain, though, how off the feeling was watching a stranger, seemingly alone, pop out from the trees in the darkness, laughing, and then try to violently enter your car in an empty parking lot. I do think the possibility of somebody else being present the whole time is a lot more scary. And I wonder who else was there, and also where exactly. For some backstory, I moved in with my ex-boyfriend at his parents' house when we were 17. I'd known him since kindergarten and was aware of his night terrors for at least five years. I believe they may have gone on for as long as they lived in that house though I'm not sure how old he was when they moved in. I didn't know much about night terrors and didn't know anyone else who had them. He also didn't want to talk a lot about it, so I never pressed. When I noticed him having one, I just saw how he would breathe heavily a few seconds to minutes and wake in a bad mood. I would best describe the mood as sort of withdrawn and irritable, I guess, and would take a few minutes to level out in order to be approachable again. The night terrors caused him to have severe insomnia and he would only ever sleep for very few hours over the course of days. I had been living there for a few months and never had any feelings of unease, which is very odd since I'm usually sensitive to energy shifts from previous experiences. Some days I would wake up and go into the kitchen to see open cabinets or drawers. I didn't think too much of this and figured that somebody must have left them open after a midnight snack. Until one morning, I jokingly mentioned how someone keeps forgetting to close the cabinets to his mum and she replies with, yeah, that's just the shadow people, as if it was something that she just casually forgot to mention. They do that all the time, followed by telling me that she and her husband both have seen them in different areas of the house on multiple occasions. But since I hadn't experienced anything there myself, I just sort of laughed it off, I guess. At this time, our bed was against the inside wall of the house beside the door from the hallway. My ex liked to play a joke on me when I would leave the room where he would reach over to hold the door handle so it wouldn't turn when I would try to get in. Harmless fun, no big deal, and we both thought that it was funny. One bright weekend, though, I thought that it would be good to do some spring cleaning and rearrange the bedroom furniture. I opened the windows to let in some cool breeze, clean the carpet, push the bed back against the outside wall next to a window and pulled the TV stand to the foot of the bed. After my ex came home, we ate and took turns having showers. When I went to open the door to the bedroom, the handle didn't turn. 
I chuckled since I was used to him playing that game. Only this time, when I went to turn the handle again, it still didn't budge. I thought that he was probably wanting to play a little more than usual, so I tried twisting the handle back and forth multiple times, but it stayed stationary. And when the latch finally released, I pushed the door open with such force that I stumbled into the room, only to see my ex playing Xbox with his headset on, sitting 15 feet away from the door and wondering why it looked like I just fell in. And that was the first time that I felt like something could be in this house. It was fall too when the knocks first started. We'd been having some strong winds accompanied with cold rain at that time. There was only one other house that shared the dead end road to the top of the hill where we lived. It was late in the evening. The rain knocked the satellite out so we got out some DVDs and we put on a movie. At some point though, we both heard scratches on the walls from the shrubs and the tree leaves hitting the siding and the windows. And then, three very faint knocks came from the wall to the right of the bed. This was an exterior wall at the front of the house, so we decided that it was from the wind. Some minutes passed when we heard three more knocks come from the wall next to the closet. An interior wall with a large shared dresser along it. We decided at this point to recreate the sound by knocking on the wall behind us just to confirm the noise that we heard. And less than a minute later, three clear knocks came from the wall directly behind us. We knocked three times back, then the knocks started coming from what seemed like all of the walls at once. They were much faster and louder this time and seemed to have no pattern as to where they were coming from. And just as fast as they came, it all stopped at once. We told his parents who came into the room and they knocked three times on the wall and they got the same response echoed back. So, back to night terrors now. Since I'd figured out when he was having an episode, I began waking up to his heavy breathing and slight twitching. I would calmly try to soothe him with a quiet voice, tell him that it's okay and that I was there. He told me that it helped, so... I decided to pry a little bit. I asked him what it was like and he only told me that the things that he used to see were always different when he was younger but more recently there was one that was reoccurring regularly. He wouldn't describe what it looked like just that it got closer to him every night and he was afraid of what would happen if it ever got close enough to touch him. He woke up once and told me that it laid down next to him and he was completely distraught because it was the closest that it ever was. But he said that it couldn't touch him when I'm around because it's afraid of you. I don't know what he meant by that, but I told him that it should be. And it was around this time when I began to notice movement. It all started with dresser drawers being open in the mornings or after we left the room. I thought maybe the drawer slides were just wearing out from use or something and were just popping back open. But it was almost always a different drawer. If I noticed three drawers open in the morning, I would just close them and go on about my day. Yet, different ones than before would be open when I came back. Sometimes they were slightly cracked and others were pulled all the way to the end. A few times we caught them opening after we closed them and tried every way that we could think of for the possibility that they weren't being closed correctly in the first place, causing them to roll back open. Then one time when my ex was napping, the drawer started to open, and I noticed his heavy breathing and panicked REM state, so I tried to soothe him with my voice, which seemed to calm him down, but then I noticed an empty pop cam by the TV stand started to rock side to side, it started slow at first, then began to move so fast that it seemed like it was almost vibrating. As it got worse, so was his breathing, so I looked at it and shouted in my mind for it to stop. And as soon as I thought it, the can stopped moving, and he was also back to a peaceful sleep. I used to be a regular lucid dreamer, but have never had sleep paralysis or any sort of experience like this one. That same night as the wobbly can, I was sleeping, curled up on my side and facing down toward the bedroom door, when I saw something. It stood in the doorway, 
taller than the frame with a shadow or misty looking sort of body and a face whiter than anything that I'd seen before. No discernible features, just as if the whiteness was light being pulled into it or through it or something. Almost looking like a, a tunnel, I guess. It, it seemed like I could feel it better than I could see it as well. And whatever it was, it felt like pure rage. It felt like anger and sadness, stronger than anything that I'd ever felt in my life. And before I could make sense of what was happening, I felt myself stand directly up out of my body, point at this creature, and yell at the top of my lungs, I command you in the name of Jesus to leave this house. I looked down and saw my ex sleeping beside me, and as quickly as I stood up, I felt straight back into my body and into the most peaceful sleep that perhaps I'd ever had. When I woke up, my ex was sitting and watching TV. I looked at him and asked what that thing looked like from his sleep paralysis, and he told me that he didn't want to talk about it, but it would be easier to draw it. He got a notebook and soon drew exactly what I had saw to the point that I immediately got chills and started crying when he showed it to me. He asked me if I'd seen it, and I told him what happened. And weirdly, neither of us had seen it since, until he came home from the military. I, a 21-year-old male, and my girlfriend, 20-year-old female, rented an apartment for a month. The area was secluded, and after dark, everybody would mind their own business pretty much. Neighbors would hardly talk to each other or even be outside in the evening. Our apartment was in a building with four floors and each floor had a single apartment. All the apartments were very compact and built to be rented to students. The night that we moved in, our taps ran out of water so I went upstairs hoping to borrow some from the people living upstairs. I realized that two out of the four apartments were vacant and locked. The apartment on the fourth floor was lit from the inside, so I decided to ring the bell, but to my disappointment, nobody answered. And over the next week, we used to hear the sound of someone whacking a rod or some sort of metal thing on maybe the floor or some other object. This would start late at night, after 1.30 in the morning, and continue for hours. Initially, we didn't care too much about it, but after some time, it got us a little bit intrigued, I guess. The sound was clearly from one of the apartments above us, but as I already mentioned, two of the three were vacant for sure, and the third one seemed vacant, but was lit from the inside. I knocked on its door many times, but nobody ever answered. The whacking sound was a daily occurrence, though, and on some very late nights, we could also hear someone climbing the building stairs. It seemed as if we were the only ones living in this building, especially during the day, and until the very late nights, there was nobody else there. We made up theories to convince ourselves that it was nothing, but the pattern of the whacking was too irregular for it to be made by wind or something other than a person. It would start almost daily at around the same time, I even thought that I could have sworn that I heard voices like, uh, I don't even want to think about that, but we asked people around but didn't get any satisfactory answers. No one knew if anyone lived there. Towards the end of our stay, I also saw a, a shady looking man going upstairs during the day. I asked him if he was the owner of the apartment upstairs. He said that he was, also including the one on the fourth floor. I asked him if anybody lived upstairs and also about the whacking sound. He told me that nobody did and that he's looking for tenants. He said that he had no idea about what the sound was. And to my surprise, he then asked me, So for how long are you going to stay here? Four days, I said. We'll leave on the 30th of this month. He asked if anybody else had rented the place for the next month and I told him that I didn't know. But the strangest part is that for the next four days, there was neither the whacking sound nor the sound of someone climbing up the stairs late at night. However, my girlfriend's internship got extended by two days and we decided to stay there and 
Just as I had anticipated, the whacking sound resumed after the 30th, the day that we were supposed to leave. I don't know what it was, I guess I'll never really know, but I'm just happy that we got out of that place without any consequences. It really scared me sometimes, and it feels weird thinking about it, even now. This happened several months ago and at the time I had recently lost my car due to a motor vehicle accident so I walked for 30 minutes to the store thinking that I'd be able to beat the sunset back but I was wrong. By the time that I was done picking up my grocery it was pitch black outside. The thing is is that I live in a pretty woodsy area where there are not even many sidewalks so I really didn't think that it was safe to walk back. I tried getting my brother and cousin to pick me up and drop me off, but they wouldn't have been able to make it for a while, so instead I decided to get a lift. There was a photo of a suspicious looking creepy old man popped up as my driver and I waited at the sidewalk for my ride. And maybe like 10 minutes later, the driver arrived. It was a silver Toyota sedan and the driver was an old man wearing a cap and large framed rectangular glasses. Instantly, something just felt off about this guy too. His aura was just wrong. But I tried not to let it bother me too much. After all, my home is literally down the street, I reminded myself. I asked him if I could set my groceries in the trunk of his car, and he nodded. I dropped it in without noticing what was in his trunk of his vehicle because where we were stopped, it was pretty dark with no street lamps. I helped myself into the car and told him that I live back there, pointing in the direction from which the vehicle had arrived and let him know that he was only a three minute drive away from my home. I saw him nod, or so I thought anyway, and as soon as the light switched to green, he made a right. I thought that he was making the right turn to turn the vehicle around, but instead he sort of passed the main road that he was supposed to take to get to my home. I let him know immediately that my home was that way while pointing in the direction, and he acknowledged it, but still kept going straight, claiming that there was an issue with his GPS, and he started driving us in the complete opposite direction of my home where the roads were completely empty. I uh, suddenly didn't feel safe. I had a terrible feeling in the pit of my stomach, in fact. In that moment of panic, I immediately reached for my phone to SOS, assuming the worst, but then I stopped myself and told myself to just calm down. Make a U-turn, I tried to tell the driver as calmly as possible. I didn't want him to hear the panic in my voice, but he didn't respond. My request to turn around was just completely ignored and I just couldn't keep calm any longer. So I finally yelled for him to make a right and turn around and he reluctantly complied. Along the way back to the road that took me to my home, it felt like the longest three minutes of my life. But just when I thought that I would finally be home safe, the driver then suggested an alternate route, even though my home was simply right and then right via the main road and very, very close by. I immediately felt that something was really, really wrong. He slowed down next to a sort of woodsy area, an isolated path along the way, asked if I'd ever been there before and that we could take this route instead. I froze. Again, I went into panic mode, but I forced myself to calm down as not to let him know that I was suspicious of him. I raised my voice once more, telling him that my home was that way while pointing toward the main road, which wasn't very far. He finally obliged after some reluctancy and started driving back toward the main road again. The entire time on the way to my home, my heart was racing and my palms were sweating. We arrived at my complex maybe five minutes later and I spoke to him very nicely so that he doesn't try something funny that would force him to react in such a manner that would put my life in further danger. I told him that I'd be tipping him well for such a short drive which would be ten dollars. I quickly hopped out of the car and jolted to the trunk to retrieve my groceries and as I grabbed my bags, I saw something that I hadn't noticed before, because this time, the street lamps surrounding my complex illuminated the trunk of his car, and 
I froze as I grabbed my groceries because in the trunk of his vehicle was a rope, a mallet, and a bag filled with something. I was immediately trembling from fear. I ran up to my building so quickly and checked outside my window as soon as I got up to my apartment to make sure that he wasn't still lurking and watching. And thankfully, I never had to hear or see from that old man ever again. If I had to guess, I would say that he was up to something evil and twisted, from which I miraculously escaped because, for whatever reason, he decided to change his mind about the intentions that he had for me that night. To this day, I can only guess as to what his intentions were, but judging by the items that I found in the trunk of his vehicle, it's not something that I would have ever had wished to find out. I live alone in an apartment in Utah. My area is fairly metropolitan, and it's not uncommon to see unhoused people near my building. Since I'm a single woman, 20, I'm usually more cautious about locking doors and setting alarms in my friends with roommates. I have an alarm system and also two deadbolt locks on my door. Because my area has lots of break-ins, I'm also sure to always lock everything no matter what. Now, two nights ago, I came home late from a night out with friends, but I was sober. I made sure to lock everything and set the alarms like usual. But when I woke up the next morning, I heard somebody in the house. They were wearing shoes and just sort of walking around. One of my friends has the code to my alarm, but none of my friends have a key. I'm the only person that I know with the key to the second deadbolt on my door. Not even my landlord has that. I leaned my head out the door of my bedroom, which is just a few feet from the more open living room or kitchen area where the sound was coming from. And there, standing there, was a, a man in my kitchen. He was about six feet tall and maybe 40 years old. He was wearing a full suit and tie, but seemed really tired or drunk, maybe. He was standing by the fridge and eating leftovers out of the Tupperware and just kind of staring. I ducked back into my room and called 911, and for the next 10 minutes, I stood by my bedroom door and listened to this man eat a bunch of food from my fridge. When he was done with something, he would just drop the container to the floor. When the police showed up, both deadbolts were still locked. They knocked on the door and the man in my apartment answered. The police rushed him and yelled that it was okay now. When I came out of the bedroom, they had the man pinned to the floor and I saw that he had rearranged the furniture in my living room. There were containers all over my floor as well. The man wasn't saying anything and he never said anything even when the police were asking him questions. After they took him away, the officer told me that the man had business cards in his wallet and apparently he works at a bank downtown. But the weirdest thing is that my alarm was set and my deadbolts were locked from the inside, even when he was in my apartment. None of the windows were unlocked and I'm on the fourth floor or open either. To this day, I still have no idea how he got into my house. It makes me wonder, how long had this guy actually been in my house for? So, the village that I lived in was only about maybe 40 to 50 people at most living there. Everyone knew everyone, all 12 of us kids knew each other too and played with each other. And naturally, some of us grouped together and explored the surrounding area since there wasn't much in the way of entertainment back then, mid to late 90s, in rural Ohio that is. The village was old. The furthest back that I could find about the village documentation wise was that it was established back in late 1790s or something as a small trading hub for the local area. Ohio didn't actually become a state until 1803. My village had a single church in the center of it, an old schoolhouse converted into an actual house just next to it, and pasture behind it with thick woods surrounding like three of the four sides of the small town. My dad grew up around the area, so he was full of legends and stories about the area. One of those stories was about a small fort that was originally French, turned British, and finally colonial American in the area. 
Nobody really knew exactly where it was located, but there was a few mentions of a small fort in the area from the research that I'd done. Now, one of the stories about this fort was that it was a primary trade route for the local native tribes and the influx of settlers that were arriving in the area. Naturally, conflicts arose as more and more people settled the surrounding area, and eventually, all that conflict ensued between the settlers and the native tribes. The fort was said to be destroyed by fire, people on both sides slaughtered each other, and eventually the natives were driven from the area with the help of a local militia. My dad always told me the land wasn't good, tainted in ways with bad energy, and I guess when entire families are slaughtered and people being driven away from their homeland, it can cause some long-term ill effects. Anyway, when all of us kids were playing, we were always told two things. One, if the woods get quiet, you get quiet and leave immediately. And two, if your name is being called out and you're way out in the woods, do not respond. Go home immediately and never look back. Pretend that you never even heard it to begin with. Everyone in the village knew how quirky the area was. Most days were the usual bland days. Well, some days it was like a, a fairy tale, I guess. Periodically other days it could be a nightmare. The people of the woods were probably the most common entity everyone in the village knew of and were generally treated with respect and a wide berth. But some of the other things were, well, generally best left well alone entirely. So, now, on to my experience. In the late 90s, I was around 10 years old when I was overcome with an insatiable desire to go camping. It was mid-August, so hot and muggy during the day, but pretty cool and mild at night. I gathered two of my friends and told them about it, and they both liked the idea. Now, generally, nobody really camped in our woods. My parents, along with many others, really didn't like the idea of a group of 10 or 11-year-olds going camping alone. My dad said that we could as long as he came with us just to ensure that we were safe, and I reluctantly agreed. Prior to that night, I went out to scout out a good area to make camp at, and I knew of a fairly decent place that was close to the creek, relatively flat and not difficult to get to. I wanted to scout the area just to ensure that it was cleared of debris and ready for tents. By this time, I was well acquainted with the people of the woods, and I made my offering before entering the woods. I didn't see them while on my journey or anything, so I felt pretty good about that. Once I arrived at the location, I began moving things around, clearing out the sticks, large stones, and making a fire pit. Even going as far as stocking it with wood and throwing some larger sticks nearby for fuel for later. I was so enthralled in what I was doing and so focused on getting the area cleared that by the time that I was satisfied with what I had done, I just noticed just how quiet everything around me became. When I say quiet too, I mean like completely dead silent. No birds, bugs, not even the wind made a noise amongst the leaf litter. I immediately shut down everything that I was doing. I stood there looking around slowing my breathing and just trying to listen for the faintest sound that I could. I don't know how long I stood there motionless. Maybe a few minutes. Maybe... But then, in the far distance, I could hear a crow call, and almost immediately I began hearing the chirping of robins and even a faint whistling from the wind in the trees. I really don't know why, but the hair on my arms and neck were on end, and I figured, well, maybe it was just me making a ruckus that everything nearby quieted down because of that? Content with that logical reasoning, I began making my way back home up for the night. And around 6pm that night, my two friends made their way over with their backpacks, tents, and both me and my dad were finishing up dinner. But all four of us made ready with everything that we needed and began trekking out to the site that I'd prepared. Nothing all that noteworthy happened going to the site, even after setting up our tents, lighting the fire and making s'mores. It was shaping up to be a pretty fun night really, and rather enjoyable. Once we started to get ready to crawl into our tents for the night, around 10 or 11 p.m., the wind started to pick up and my dad said that we might be in for some rain, but he didn't seem to have a look of contentment. My dad loved the rain, 
on his face when he said it. It was like, I don't know, he felt something was off or something. And it wasn't long that all of us started to feel that way too. We all sort of ended up crawling into our tents anyway since it was night time. And with possible rain incoming, trekking back home would have really sucked. But honestly, we should have walked back. We situated our tents in a sort of half circle around the fire pit, which all were facing the creek and the back of the tents facing the wood line. My dad was to the left of me in his military surplus tent, and me in my cheapo Walmart single person tent, just barely large enough for me, and my two friends to my right in their own tents. The wind was howling for some time, half an hour to an hour before it calmed down, and then it got quiet. No crickets, no wind, no wildlife at all. The creek itself, which usually bubbles happily along, sounded muted all of a sudden. All we had at that time was the faint glow of embers from the fire pit in front of our tents casting a warm glow. I began to hear my heart throbbing in my ears and I knew that my dad and my two friends were just as anxious as I was as I could hear them sort of shifting uncomfortably. I heard one of my friends tent zipper and naturally I undid my zipper too to see what was going on. And as soon as I popped my head out to look... I saw my dad come out of his tent with a machete that he had and he faced the wood line. My friend had his head poking out too and asked if I heard what that noise was. I didn't hear anything, but my heart was pounding so hard that it was hard hearing him even whisper. We both partially got out of the tent to see what my dad was looking at, but all we could see was like inky darkness and it was then that I heard it. A distant and faint hello. It was coming from some ways away in the darkness of the woods. I could see my dad shift uncomfortably on his feet, white knuckling his machete, looking into the wood line. Then again, a voice called out, hello. But it just didn't seem right. It was off-putting, almost as if whoever was speaking was trying to speak in a, a very feminine voice, faint and fragile. My dad motioned me to grab some of the extra wood next to his tent and throw it on the fire, which I reluctantly did. Leaving the perceived safety of my tent didn't sit well with me. As the fire began to slowly grow in brightness, my dad stepped backwards near the fire and stood there facing the wood line. By this time, my other friend popped his head out of his tent too and all three of us, including my dad, were just watching the wood line, unsure what to expect. Nothing came out and we didn't hear the voice again. An hour passed and by this time my dad was sitting on a large stone next to his tent, one leg crossed and a machete in his right hand watching silently, only the sound of crackling fire echoing against the shale cliff face across the creek. Several hours passed and both my friends went back into their tents, only me and my dad were out, me tending the fire and my dad watching and waiting. I could hear rustling to our right, just beyond the light from the fire in the tree line. My friend closest to it popped his head out, looked at me and asked, what? As if he was wanting me to repeat what I said. Mind you, I didn't say a word. I hadn't said a word since I came out of my tent the first time, in fact. I put my finger up to my lips and motioned to be quiet. By the time that I did this, my dad was standing next to me and told us both to shush and... Immediately, we heard someone say, come here, in the same off-putting feminine voice as earlier. All three of us stood there, peering into the direction of where the voice come from, and shortly after, we heard what sounded like something moved back deeper into the woods. It didn't sound heavy, it sounded like something sort of lightly trotting back into the woods. And that was the last time that we heard it. Shortly after, I'm assuming early morning, just before daybreak that is, the wood life returned, crickets, the distant chirp of the birds and the whisper from the wind through the leaves, everything. Once daybreak came, we all broke our tents down and we packed up and began hiking back home quick smart. We were paranoid the entire way back, stopping, listening and looking. 
We didn't see or hear anything or anyone. Nobody said a word on the way back, in fact. But once we made it back to my backyard, my dad broke the silence and told us that what we had just experienced never happened, and it would do us good to not say a word to anyone about it. He had fear written all over his face as if not even he had experienced something like that before. To this day, I really don't know what it was or perhaps who it was. I did at one point end up asking my aunt next door later in life if she'd experienced something similar since she grew up in the area too, but even she was really tight-lipped about it, saying that well, we shouldn't have gone camping out there and my dad was a fool for letting us go. I have since left my village and I've moved out of state and I have run into similar stories down here in the southeast with the same reluctance to explain what it was or could be. I really don't know why people are so afraid to talk about it, but if any of you guys can enlighten me, then I'm really all ears at this point because I would like to know what the heck happened that night. So, a group of friends and myself rented a place on a lake for just a, a fun-filled drunken weekend. We were all in our young to mid-twenties, and it was supposed to be just a big party. For the most part, that's what it was too. The Friday night and Saturday morning, we pretty much went all out having a blast on the water and just having fun, really. Stupid stuff. And well, naturally, when Saturday afternoon rolled around... We were all so dead from going out that we decided that it would be a night of no drinking, maybe a little bit of smoking, and just kind of having a chill evening and night. But that's what it was too, relaxed. So 9pm comes rolling around and about 8 of us were inside of the house and 5 outside. The house was a two story with a second story back or sort of deck porch and it was surrounded by woods and then down through the woods you would then hit the lake. I'll mention too that we had already experienced some weird vibes from the locals when we first arrived in town, mostly just backcountry old timers that I assumed were leering and irritated because we were a bunch of college age kids looking to have a good time. But the town and the lake were large so it's not like anyone knew where we were staying. Anyways, three of my friends were on the upstairs back porch and my other friend and I, we were downstairs outside just talking on this little old table near the woods. I mean, it was otherwise just a really nice night. My friend and I were just getting lost in the conversation and all of a sudden there was this weird feeling that encompassed us. Like an unnerving physical experience that came from the woods behind us. It was so strong in fact that we both kind of quieted down. And then, out of nowhere, this loud chanting abruptly comes from the woods. I have no idea how far away it was because of the way the lake is set up but I'm pretty sure the voice is carried up through the forest and it sounded like a, a cult chanting away and all of the voices were male. I mean, they were loud and perfectly in sync. I think we were frozen for all of 20 seconds before I just couldn't contain myself and darted towards the house with her following me. I don't know how to explain it too, the feeling that came with that chanting, but it was almost, I don't know, evil like just something powerfully uninviting i was shaking by the time that we got to the second story though and ran out onto the balcony with the other three friends one of them was my brother and by the time that we got up there the chanting was gone and i naturally asked did you guys hear that and in the most shaky freaked out voices they all said that they had heard it too and not seconds later the chanting began again so, the five of us are out there peering into the forest listening to this chanting that would sometimes sound far away and then also sound relatively close. All male voices in the weirdest language, or I don't even know what it was to be honest. Sounded like a strange, I don't know, church or something. Then, following the chanting, a loud bang like someone hit a huge metal object sounded. And then the worst part came. A man wailing like in extreme pain. All of my hair was up on end and it was the freakiest experience that I've ever had. 
My brother and I were staring at each other in a mixture of scared excitement and horror. The wailing stopped all of a sudden, and then it was back to the chanting, which eventually died out. I was so freaked out by it that I wanted to call the cops because whoever screamed had been in a lot of pain. That much was obvious. That, mixed with the weird chanting, just made me immediately think of some terrible sacrifice going on. One friend tried to say that it had to be some drunk guys just messing around singing and being weird, but no way was that coming from some drunk guys. They were perfectly in sync. Then the bang and then the wail of pain like that? And then all that weird tension and energy was just gone? No. I didn't call the cops and, to be honest, I wish that I would have, but... The forest was so large and since the lake house was up looking down at the woods and the lake as well, it really could have been anywhere. It definitely wasn't in our close proximity, but it was close enough to hear all of that perfectly. After this though, we, we just went in and got some of the others, but by the time that they came out, the chanting had stopped. Someone wanted to go and explore and find out where it had been coming from, but obviously that was a stupid idea. After that, I was really ready to go home, and I can't explain the relief of driving away from there the next morning. Even now, it gives me the worst feeling thinking about it. Whatever it was, it felt so wrong and evil, and I'll never forget that moment. I can only imagine that it was some weird cold stuff, but maybe, maybe it was a lot worse. I was working at my first job ever in retail. I was around 20 years old. It was a busy morning, 9am, somewhere mid-December, hence why it was so busy. And I was working the checkouts as per usual, scanning items, ringing up customers and all that jazz. About an hour into my shift, I think, I was serving an elderly man who bought just a handful of items. After giving him his subtotal, uh, another guy behind him smelling of booze stretched out, handed me cash, and I kindly told him that I wasn't serving him. I was serving the man in front of him. Then I looked down and saw that he was buying some cheap knockoff branded Baileys, some booze, and of course, I figured that this guy was pretty much wasted. Now, just as I was taking payment from the elderly man, I was planning in my head how I was going to tell this next guy that I can't sell alcohol to him as he's already drunk. And as this was my first job and I'd never encountered this sort of thing before, I was feeling a bit anxious. So I finished serving and now on to the drunk guy. I looked around in hopes to find another colleague or my manager perhaps, but there wasn't one in sight or available to help, so... I just sort of looked at the man and just before I opened my mouth I felt which I felt like someone grabbed a fistful of my hair and something sharp poking me in the back and of course a man whispered in my ear to which I also smelled alcohol on his breath serve my mate he pushes which I'm assuming was a knife harder into my back now and then says now in complete shock, I said nothing, just scanned the bottle, took the cash, and then they were gone. I quickly turned around to my colleague working checkouts behind me, but all they did was look at me and ask if I was okay, completely unaware of what had just happened. Then I went for a break. I, I see my manager pass by, so I rushed over to him and told him what had just happened. All he did was laugh because he thought that I was joking, but criticized me for selling alcohol to someone under the influence. Whatever that sharp object that was in my back cut me, though, before my break, I could feel blood running down my back, and it was really sore. Of course, I couldn't see blood as my uniform is black, but I screamed, it's true, it did happen. I turned around and lifted my hair as I have very long hair and said, lift up my shirt or get my female colleague to do it. This guy sliced me. But the manager just said, yuck, no, I don't want to see you lift up your shirt and just walked away staring into his phone. Well, I didn't return to finish my shift. I snuck out of the store, took a taxi and went home. 
and my mom cleaned up my back and dressed it. But then the next morning she called work to tell them that I wasn't going to be returning as the manager's incompetence to take action when I could have almost been stabbed over a bottle was just not good enough. So this first story happened to me when I was 16 and lived in my parents' house. It was late one night in summer and I was in one of my two bedrooms. My brother and sister, both older than me, already lived in their own and I got one of their bedrooms for myself which sort of made me get two. In one bedroom I spent the night sleeping in my bed next to my desk and closet. The other one I would spend the day over there, sort of packed with my TV, my Playstation, a sofa and another closet. I was watching South Park on TV around 2.30 in the morning while laying on my sofa. I always stayed up that late during the summer holidays and why I remember this so well is because of the episode of South Park that was running on MTV this night, The Losing Edge. It's my favorite episode and on that day it was quite hot in Germany and there wasn't a cloud in the sky the whole day. So as I said, it was night time, still really hot. Hot here is like 26 degrees Celsius. But while I was watching TV, all of a sudden, the temperature just dropped. And I felt like cold air in my room. The next thing that I remember were faint noises from outside my room. At first, I thought that one of my parents were maybe out there, who was sleeping, since I hadn't seen them open a door for like a couple of hours. But that wasn't it. The noise got louder and I muted my TV just to listen to the noises and to try and locate where they were coming from and they definitely came from outside of my room. So I, I got up, walked to the door and opened it. The hallway was pitch black and I couldn't see anything except for the steps to my right which were lit up by my still running muted TV screen. Also I couldn't really make out that both of my parents were asleep. That's because my parents, uh, even to this day, sleep in separate rooms because of heavy snoring. Both of them, that is. So, it definitely wasn't my parents, but what was that noise? I step into the hallway and to the right down the hallway. On the left side was the front door, and both my rooms were the first rooms to the left and right from the front door. Which meant that I needed to go deeper into the house to locate the noises. As I walked through the dark hallway, I, I could sort of make out that the noises sounded like cupboard doors opening and closing, but not rapidly, more like slowly and gently, with the familiar clonk of wood hitting on the wood at the end. But the only room in our house with cupboards was the kitchen, which is in the same room as the living room and the dining room. So step by step, I sort of walked to the door my head to the side, pushing my ear forward, trying to hear the sound better. The next thing that I heard was sort of like a, a rattling sound, as if two plates were constantly put onto each other, and I thought that maybe one of my parents must be inside the kitchen. So I took the door handle into my hand and began to turn it, but all of a sudden there was just nothing. The sound stopped all of a sudden. I decided not to step into the kitchen and I turned around to walk back into my room through the still dark hallway and that's when the sound started up again. Halfway back I turned around in the middle of the hallway and walked back to the door again but when I got there nothing. The sound stopped again. My heart started to race at that moment. I wasn't sure if I should open the door or not so I waited for a full 30 seconds just to see if the sound restarted and yeah it did. They started again and this time even louder and much more frantic than before. I was half scared out of my mind at this point but I collected my courage and I opened the door. As I stepped into the kitchen and lit up the room the sound stopped and the strangest thing was that the kitchen was completely untouched. Everything was in its place. But I freaked when I felt the cold air pass by me while I was still standing in the kitchen, panicky, turning around and man, that is the most terrifying moment that I've ever been through. 
Moments later, I could feel the hot air from the summer night again. I shut the light, closed the door, and I ran back into my room. There was heavy breathing, sweating, and my heart was racing like crazy. Needless to say, I wondered the whole night what the heck this incident was, and didn't sleep her, not even a minute. The next morning, I asked my parents if they noticed anything, or if they were in the kitchen after midnight at all, but they almost simultaneously said no. So then, the obvious question is, what was it? This uh, happened to me last night, and I really don't know how to explain it. For a bit of context though, my father recently became ill, so I've moved home to help out my mother for a little while at least. I still have young siblings and a grandparent living in the house, so I decided to stay in my parents' caravan out back. They only use it in the summer, so I thought that I could get some privacy there. Now, the caravan gets cold at night, so my dad gave me an electric heater to warm it up. But my mother is very worrisome and is worried leaving it on overnight. It could start a fire and all that. So last night, I go to sleep and at around 4am, I hear banging on my window. I jump up and open the curtain and my mother was standing there. I'm not going to lie, I was a little bit worried that something had happened to my father, but she was just there to tell me to turn the heater off. I say, great, thanks for waking me up for that, then try to get some sleep. And this is where the weirdness begins. You see, just as I turn over, I begin to hear this very faint crying. At first, I thought it was someone in the house, but it was coming from the direction of the shed behind the caravan. I think to myself that it's just some fox or other animal, but it slowly starts to get louder... Not extremely loud, but loud enough that it was keeping me up. I fling the curtains open to scare whatever animal was out there, but there was no animals. Instead, I see a child-sized shadow thing sitting against the shed, its head in its knees, crying. And man, I have never jumped up so quickly in my life. I instantly turned on all the lights and ran back to the window, but... When I did, it was gone, and the crying had stopped. I quickly jotted down all the features of it so I wouldn't forget, and I stayed up with the lights on all night after that. I'm scared that it's going to come back at some point. Does anybody have any info on what this could be? Like I said, it was child size. It was like a shadow. Super dark. Darker than the night, in fact. But the only features that I could see was its body. And quite honestly, I've never been so scared in my life. So the first paranormal experience that I had was back when my age was in the single digits. Maybe around seven or eight years old. I grew up in the Midwest, Ohio to be more specific. The town, or village as we grew up calling it, was not large by any means. Maybe around 40 to 50 people at most. During this time though, my family didn't have the internet or cable TV. Cell phones were just starting to become mainstream. Mid-90s era. And as such, entertainment was mostly chores or roaming the surrounding area, just exploring. My house was backed by fairly dense woods. There was a steep decline with a relatively flat wooded area where a creek ran through it. This creek wasn't very deep, ways deep in certain areas but mostly near ankle deep, but it was pretty wide. Growing up, I, I practically lived in those woods, hiking up and down that creek, mapping the woods, exploring a few long abandoned and collapsed houses that nature reclaimed. I lived and breathed nature practically and those woods were my home, my way from home. My father grew up in that area. My aunt and uncle and cousins lived just next door and it was a pretty close-knit community. Naturally, everyone has ghost stories about their own hometown. A haunted house, a tragedy of some sort that remains a stain on its history. And my village, well, it was no different. My father would always tell stories about ghosts or abnormal happenings that he experienced in his youth year. 
One thing that he would always tell me when I told him that I was going into the woods was the trees may not walk about or talk, but they do see and remember. I always thought of that as him just saying, don't be stupid out there. Now, at my first encounter with the people of the woods, which is what I always called them, was when I was on one of my daily excursions into the wild green. It was mid-July and it was hot and humid. I stuck mostly to the creek as it was pretty cool there, and I didn't have to battle my way through the thick undergrowth as well, which was a plus. But I hiked approximately about two miles along the creek hunting for crawdads, crawfish, and looking for signs of deer, rabbit, or the fabled albino squirrel that we had here. I kept traveling and eventually arrived at a relatively open field that had waist-high grass, and I frequently stopped here to gather wild blackberries, rest, and spook the few white-tailed deer bedded in the area. But that day, that day was different. You see, as I drew closer to the field, I noticed someone standing in the field. Instinctively, I slowed down, lowered my posture, and tried to minimize my noise. I really wasn't used to seeing someone out this far into the woods. The nearest house to that location was maybe about a mile and a half through thick undergrowth and fairly steep ravines to climb. As I hugged the bank of the creek, I moved to the edge of the open field, slowly peeking up over the tall grass to see if they were still there. But nothing. I thought that perhaps they had seen or heard me trudging through the creek and instinctively ducked down too. I wasn't about to find out though, so I turned around and headed back home, all two and a half miles back. I was more aware of my surroundings and far more cautious of my sound as I moved that time, avoiding walking in the creek to prevent the sloshing of water to give me away. As I crept through the branches jutting out into the bank of the creek, I made my way to another area that I was familiar with. A small game trail ran through here and it would cut my time and distance back home a good bit. The only downside was that it was pretty overgrown to either side and portions had thick thorn bushes. The entire time that I trekked back though, I don't know, I just felt like I was being watched. I never really felt in danger or vulnerable of being attacked or anything, but I could almost swear that I felt eyes on me. I was uneasy the entire time that I followed the game trail, routinely stopping and listening to determine if I could hear footsteps or if I was being followed at all. But still, nothing. I made it about, I would say, halfway back home when all of a sudden I saw in the corner of my eyes a figure standing a short distance away. But as I moved my eyes in the direction of the figure, they seemed to just sort of meld into the foliage. I thought that uh, maybe my paranoia was making me see things. So I just hurried on. A few hundred more feet in, I see again another figure, this time further away out of my peripheral. And again, as I looked in that direction, they sort of meld back into the background. But this time it happened twice. As I looked and that figure disappeared, another appeared again in my peripherals closer, but still a ways away. Again, the entire time I never really felt in danger or anything. It creeped out, yes, but I never felt like whatever there was was nefarious and intent. This continued on for the remainder of my time, making my way back home, but the more it happened, the less I felt, I don't know, afraid of the figures. Even going as far as saying out loud, I know you're there, I don't know what you want, but I'm not here to cause trouble. Eventually, I made it back to my backyard, and I turned around to face the woods to see if they were there, but there was nothing. Now, my father was next to the shed, burning some cut grass in the backyard. I walked over to him to tell him what I had experienced, and before I could say a word, he looked at me and, with a slight grin, said, I saw you saw them too. I guess that I had the look of terror written on my face. Without even missing a beat, he put down the hoe that he was using to stoke the fire, walked past me to the wood line, and pulled out the can of dip that he had in his pocket. He opened it, took a pinch out, and placed it on a stone that was jutting out from the ground and walked back. I asked what he was doing, and he said that he gave them an offering. He began explaining what he meant by the trees see and remember, 
that it was important that we respect nature whenever we enter her domain and give an offering in return when we take things from her. Otherwise, she just may not let us back out. He gave me the can of dip and said that what I saw were what he believed were spirits of Native Americans keeping watch over their former land. I really didn't know what they were at the time, but I just followed suit with what my dad did whenever I made my way back into the woods. I always left an offering, and although I did see them from time to time, I, I never felt like I was in any danger, and I always made sure to respect them. If they appeared in my peripherals, I would travel in the opposite direction, apologizing for any transgressions. My cousins and many people in my village, they were all aware of their existence too, and just kind of gave them a, a wide berth whenever they appeared. I was completely oblivious to their existence, but... When I learned of them and experienced them, a whole lot of people opened up about them, about some of the history of the town and stuff like that. It was an interesting experience and it's something that I'll never forget. It definitely was creepy, but again, thankfully, uh, I never felt like I was in any danger. Growing up as a teenager, it was just me and my mum that lived together. An important part of the story is the fact that our house was in the country, about 40 miles away from the big city that we lived close to. When I started high school, I went to private school in the big city, and my mum also worked in the city too. For convenience, my mum bought a house in the city near my school and work, but we kept the country house for weekends and stuff. It's also critical to know that this country house was in some fancy pants sort of gated, secured and patrolled neighborhood. It was a two-story house and we never went upstairs. Maybe once a year when my mum would host Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner at our house. But apart from that, that was pretty much it. The upstairs was a, an informal living area, a bar, a bathroom and a game room as well. There just wasn't reason to go up there ever really. Also, the downstairs dining room and formal living room were absolutely 100% off limits. I was never allowed to walk in there or go in there unless it was a hosted dinner for like Christmas or Thanksgiving. It was kept like a, a museum, oddly. Anyway, I never really moved into the city house. I kept all of my clothes and belongings in the country house because we still had all of our animals at the country house. I would drive home every day after school to do my homework, feed the animals, watch TV, and just do stuff around the house. After my homework was done, I would pack an overnight pack of clothes for the next day at school and then drive to the city house. We did, however, spend all of our weekends back home at the country house. Now, one day, I come home after school and I'm just messing around in the house. I finish my homework and animal duties and I go to pack my bag for the next day at school. And my dresser drawers were really messed up and things weren't really folded anymore. It looked as if someone was rummaging through my clothes, in fact. I honestly thought that I'd just messed them up last time that I was packing clothes or something. I go to leave the house and there's a, a crystal bowl turned over upside down on one of the living room tables. I'm honestly shocked I even noticed, but I did because, like I said, everything in that room was kept in museum quality. I thought it was odd, but nothing really more of it. I went to the city house, and that was that. The next day, though, I'm back at the country house after school and finished my homework and animal duties again. This time, my closet seemed a bit in disarray, and at this point, I think, hang on... My mum came home in the middle of the day to see if I had drugs or something in my room, which I didn't. I wasn't into anything like that. However, when I was leaving the house, I noticed that there was a second crystal bowl turned over on one of the living room tables right next to the first one. So this definitely stood out to me and I went into the room and completely surveyed the room. Yes, for a fact, there are only two bowls turned over upside down. I sort of leave, drive to the city house and ask my mum if she went through my room. She denies it and asks, do you think someone has been in the house? I say no because, well, nothing is missing. 
Plus, in the back of my head, I'm thinking, it's in a gated, patrolled, and secure neighborhood. How is that even possible? Anyway, the third day I go to school and a girl a year younger than me at my private high school actually lives directly across the street from the country house. On the off chance we ever stayed the night there, I always drove her to school with me. She comes up to me and says, We saw you leaving your driveway this morning and we flashed our lights at you, but it was foggy so I guess you didn't see. At this point, I'm definitely thinking that it's my mum going through my room because my mum and I, at the time, drove matching white Mercedes. So I'm thinking that my neighbour saw my mum's car leaving or something. I drive to the country house after school again and I walk in and immediately I see a third bowl turned over upside down in the living room. Chills covered my entire body at this. I walk into my room, bed sheets stripped, pillowcases gone, so many things from my bookshelves were missing. It was completely ransacked. I immediately ran outside of the house and called my mum and then the police. When the police showed up, my mum, who was driving to the house but still on the phone with me, asked me to go into her bedroom closet and look under the stack of jeans on her higher shelf. And there was nothing there. But it's apparently one of the three places my mum kept her jewellery. She started sobbing and she asked me to check under her underwear in the drawer. And no... No jewelry there either. She asked me to check under her winter sweaters, but no, nothing there either. She is then hysterical at this point. She asked me to check under the stove, and no, there was nothing there either. That's apparently where she kept a heavy wooden box of silverware that her parents brought her from Sweden when they moved to America. Which means that everything that was of considerable value or heritage was completely gone every little thing. Weirdly though, the security gate had zero unauthorized visitors on the cameras and none of them were in white Mercedes or anything like that. But from my neighbor's testimony, that's what her and her mum saw coming out of our driveway that one morning. The police did a full sweep of the house and identified a space in the upstairs game room where apparently someone had been living. And there were soda cans in the attic space that is access through a small door in the upstairs bar. Apparently, I had been coming home as a 16-year-old while somebody or multiple persons were living in our upstairs spaces and had been doing a full scope of the house and all the assets to steal them. To add insult to injury as well, my mother unfortunately died unexpectedly about three weeks after the robbery happened. Anything at all of value of hers or of heritage to my Swedish family was now completely gone. The insurance claim that my father had to make, who was entirely out of the picture, turned out to be $480,000. Now, the worst part is that I'm only 16 years old. And remember how my neighbor saw a white Mercedes coming out of her driveway? Well, the local police in the very small town or village that this country house was in, they tried to charge me with robbery and insurance fraud, assuming that I took all of the stuff from our house. It only lasted about two weeks, but it was intensely brutal. I cried pretty much nonstop, and it was just unending tears for me at that time. When my mother had just died... I was working with lawyers to fight my innocence against stealing valuable family assets or heirlooms. And on top of that, there was the creepy reality that I had been in the house with these people. These people that had been living in this house, stealing things, and who knows what they were capable of. I'm 29 and work as a security guard doing nights in the UK. The site that I usually do my duty at is in the northwest of England, but I won't give the name of the site or specific areas to keep my job secure. This is a bit of a long story, but I'm confident that anybody interested in this sort of stuff will be satisfied. So, I was in the army at the time when one of my closest friends landed his first job. 
He was always a very hardcore skeptic, but started to tell me that he was experiencing things that were weird and freaking him out sometimes. After the army, I went into a couple of random jobs whilst I got my momentum back in regular life and also got myself an SIA license. Eventually, my power got shipped off to another site for the same customer and I jumped at the opportunity to work in his place. My pal Jason kindly drove me to the site for my induction to meet the guard on duty that night. The guard on duty was a very down-to-earth guy in his 50s, I guess, and after showing me the ropes, the whole five minutes, he asked me what I'd think about poltergeists. I told him briefly about some of the experiences that I've had throughout my life, and his eyes lit up, which sparked a casual friendship ever since. Basically, he told me about two guards leaving in the past due to strange things happening at this site, and that every guard has experienced at least one thing there. He's also a lot deeper into this stuff than I was, but it adds to his harmless charm, and we've shared many deep conversations about the subject. Anyway, Saturday night during the Christmas holidays in 2018, I locked myself in for the first time and ready to spend the next 12 hours alone enjoying my own company and getting paid for it. A gaming laptop straight out, albeit on whisper volume of course, and frequent heads up in case of intruders or van drivers coming to collect their personal vehicles. This place is quite creepy looking as it's out in the sticks somewhat and surrounded by farmland but I'm pretty used to cutting about in dark places similar from my time in the army, so it was just whatever to me. And for the first few shifts, I just heard the odd strange noise, which quite frankly could have been anything, from temperature expansion, contraction, to wildlife, you name it. However, on the night prior to the staff returning to work for 2019, I had one of the most profound paranormal experiences of my life which genuinely scared me. It was the 3am to 4am hourly patrol. I stepped off at about 3.30 and as I put one foot out of the guardroom door, a tiny stone whizzed around the guardroom bouncing off the metal lockers, desk, etc. and at head to torso height. I'm about 6 feet tall. This just didn't make any sense but I shrugged it off and continued on my way. The first part of my patrol involved walking around the back of a two-story medium-sized office building where there are lots of stone pebbles to walk on before coming out of the back of the offices and onto a relatively large car park about two-thirds the size of a football pitch. As soon as I stepped foot on the tarmac, a pebble landed next to me and to be honest, I didn't really think much of it. I could have easily kicked one up a bit with my steel toe boots and not felt it, so whatever, right? I got halfway across this car park and another landed just in front of me as if it came from behind me. This is where I started to feel things weren't quite right as the pebbles were way back by this point and I would have felt it this time due to the added force of it. I continued and at the end of the car park were a row of shipping containers on the left and a huge biffer skip on the right. The patrol route takes me walking in between these for about 30 meters and this is by far the creepiest part of the site as it's so dark and dingy there. And this is where things began to get pretty intense. So I was still walking towards this area and roughly 20 meters away when another pebble hit the, the biffer skip loudly about five or six feet high. In other words, I would have had to have get a bit of a run up and put effort into booting a pebble hard enough to hit it like that, high enough, and to match the force it hit with. This really startled me and I stood still and confused for about 30 seconds looking all around myself but there was nobody and I was equipped with a 400 lumen heavy duty torch so I could see for quite a distance but there was nobody whatsoever. I sort of reluctantly carried on out of duty down the alley past the skip that had just been hit and the shipping containers to my left. I had gotten about maybe 10 meters past the first shipment when it sounded as if somebody ran up to it with a sledgehammer and just gave it a huge whack. My backside almost swallowed my pants hole at that point and it took every ounce of courage to immediately run back into the car park and shine my torch in all directions. 
If this was a human due to the layout of the site, they could not have gotten away in time unless they could contest like Usain Bolt and even that would be a stretch considering that it probably took me like two seconds to sprint there, if that. Now, the guard who gave me the induction is that interested in this stuff that he told me to call him if anything like this happens, no matter the hour. So I continued to the center of the car park to get a full field view of the site, but of course, there was nobody. Suddenly, I just heard these bangs coming from all directions, but confined to within the site. Shortly followed by tiny stones constantly whizzing past my shins with a low trajectory, similar to how one would throw skimming stones across a body of water, I suppose. The thing is about these stones whizzing past me, though, is that the direction that they were coming from was a huge three-story high warehouse with no windows or doors from my point of view. So these tiny stones were being thrown at me from, like, an unseen force for 100% certainty as all that was there was three stories of brick wall. Never once did any of them hit me, but they just sort of whizzed by my legs left and right. Behind this warehouse is a river that gets quite choppy in the winter, but even so, the trajectory dictated that the stones were definitely being thrown from in front of me and not over the warehouse, which would be next to an impossible feat anyway. In any case, I rang the other guard and he could immediately hear the racket going on. He told me to go by the river and call out to it. Now, despite having a few experiences sparsely throughout my life, I have never been interested in engaging with whatever the phenomena is, but I decided to humor him anyway, all the while half scared to death. I called out to it though, I really can't remember what I said, and everything immediately just sort of stopped and went silent. But weirdly enough as well, nothing further happened that night, and the other guard said that he's never known anybody to get terrorized quite that badly by it. Once the staff arrived, I spoke to one of the blokes managing the site, and he said that he would check the CCTV footage for any messes. Interestingly, the next shift, a couple of days later, the cleaner who used to be around for a couple of hours after the staff leave called me into the office block to see a document printed out of an email. This was to my security firm about the events, but stated that they could not see anybody or any stones on the camera, but could see me doing an intense investigation and being violently startled a few times. Since then, I've had very sparse experiences, such as door slamming, a filled mop bucket moving like three feet from the wall in front of my eyes, plate smashing in the canteen. Very annoying, as security often gets the blame for this, understandably too. Cutlery having a quick jangle in the canteen drawer, a loud sound of what can only be described as heavy cardboard boxes being dragged along the dusty warehouse floor, and footsteps coming from the room above. A few months into the job, I also got another very close friend of mine, a, a job there as well, who was also in the army prior and also a massive skeptic, until now. He literally laughed at myself and Jason whilst we gave him his induction when we mentioned the strange stuff. But Jason to this day references his cocky laugh as his attitude soon got set straight, but... So, a few nights into my other friend, his name is Scott, working there... I got woken up to a phone call at around 1.30 in the morning, and, as you can probably guess, it's Scott with a trembly voice saying that somebody had just sprinted up the stairs, ran through the short corridor, and is currently stood outside the guardroom door. I said, well, you're a security guard, do your job and see who it is. Of course, nobody was there, and nobody could be there, due to the coded doors. Now, I haven't experienced anything paranormal there for a long time at this point. It seems to have, I don't know, like weeks or months of calm, followed by short bursts of activity. I've also since branched out and done all of the sites my company contracts with and never had any experience elsewhere besides one place to which I have a video evidence of that actually, but I'm reluctant to share it and... Even then, I need permission from the guard who works at that particular site. I've even worked at a number of derelict, creepy old mills with nothing strange on it. So this was 
definitely an experience. I do have one more story about an experience in my teens for another time, and uh, that's pretty much everything that's happened to me, but anyway, I hope you enjoyed the story, and uh, here's hoping that nothing else happens after this. I'm a, a single male, 33, who lives alone in Denver. My apartment complex is uh, not what you would call a nice building by any means. Uh, I'm on a, a road close to Colfax Avenue, which, if you're familiar with the geography of this area, is not the safest boulevard in town. I'm a few streets away from it, but close enough that I wouldn't consider this uh, an up-and-standing or up-and-coming neighborhood. Anyway, this evening I, I was watching Netflix on my couch. My two cats were cuddled up against me as I lay under a comforter. The night before, I had watched a horror movie that was scary enough to leave me in an unsettled mood, making it hard to sleep. So this night, I decided to watch a stand-up special instead, keep it light so I wouldn't have any trouble getting some shut-eye. I have classes early the next morning, so I was surprised when I made the conscious decision to turn on a second stand-up special and let myself fall asleep on the couch. I was just so comfy where I was laying and I didn't want to move, not even to turn off the several lights on throughout my apartment. Now, I remember dozing off around probably 11 o'clock. It was effortless, which meant that I was really snug under the covers with my cats flanking me on either side, creating a, a tucking in feeling. I fell into a dream wherein I was on an impromptu date with this guy who I didn't recognize at a blockbuster video store of all things. He bought me blue and yellow underwear, you know, like a blockbuster would sell in dreamland, insinuating that I would take the hint of his intentions. He was also desperate for a job, so when we got to the counter, he was given an off-the-cuff interview, and that didn't go well. And all of a sudden, I'm just not sleeping anymore. I'm woken up by a knock at my door. Then a man's voice says, maintenance, and I just sort of sat there, Sitting bolt upright on my couch, I knew something was off immediately and I looked at my phone, which was by my left hand and the time was 2.15 in the morning. I didn't move. The floors in my apartment are really old and there are many creaky floorboards. I didn't want whoever this was knocking to know that somebody was actually home and awake, let alone alert to his presence. My cats got up though and ran over to the door as they normally would, but... I stayed still and listened. After a few minutes with no answer, the man walked away from the door and down the hallway to the stairs. A moment after that, I heard the back door to the building swing open and closed. I have one window where I have partial view of that door, so I break my paralysis and race over to it. What I saw was an odd-looking green SUV sitting in the no-parking zone just in front of the back door. It must have been running the entire time because I didn't hear it start up and the brake lights were glowing red. Someone, presumably the maintenance man, got in the car and just drove off. Now, obviously, I don't know what his intentions really were, but no one knocks on someone's door at like 2.15 in the morning claiming to work for the landlord with good deeds in mind, right? Had it been a true emergency, wouldn't he have knocked again? used his service key to get into the unit? What did I just avoid here? I can only assume that it was an attempted robbery at best, or maybe an abduction at worst. When I was watching the SUV drive off, I surveyed the other apartment windows. They were all dark, and I can see every unit except the two other corner apartments below me from the vantage point. I think because my apartment sort of sticks out from the building and has many windows, maybe I was targeted because my lights were visibly on and noticeable from the street or something. However, I don't know how this individual got into the building in the first place as you would need a key to do so. I've never been so legitimately afraid as a single person living alone. I'm grateful that I installed a security chain on my door when I moved in too. I'm also really glad that, even in my disorientated state, I had the presence of mind not to move from the couch or make any noise. 
My nerves are definitely shot. I don't think that I'll be going back to dreamland anytime soon. I've turned off all the lights save for the lamp by my bed. I usually can't sleep with it on, but tonight, uh, I really don't think that I'm going to be getting much sleep anyway. So, this is a story that my brother and I had driving to a friend's house in our neighbor village. The friend invited us to chill out in his apartment with a bunch of other buddies, and we had nothing to do anyway, so we decided to drive to him. And it was almost in the middle of the 10 kilometer distance between our two villages. I'm driving with high beam because the road is pretty dark here and not illuminated. When all of a sudden, I, I saw a man standing on the street with a seemingly pretty bad head injury holding his hand in front of his eyes because my lights were blinding him. While approaching this man, we then saw two other men sitting on the autumn foliage right by the road, seesawing their upper bodies also with head and torso injuries. I emergency braked the car and this man standing approached us while my brother started panicking and told me that I should reverse ASAP. It really didn't feel like a normal situation, especially after a possible car accident or anything similar. It was like these guys were just sort of chilling there on purpose. But when I started reversing, he began running at us and yelled, you should drive slowly, we are here, and stuff like that. I turned the car and drove back home, shocked and confused. My brother called the police to check out what was going on with these three men, but... We never did hear anything about it after this, but whatever happened that night, it was a pretty disturbing incident. So for some background, I've been a behavioral health nurse for about 12 years now, and my first job was at a freestanding mental health facility in the south. This facility is uh, pretty uniquely constructed as it was originally a plantation owned by a wealthy Irishman who emigrated here sometime in the 1700s. The original plantation house, it's still there and is now used as the business office and the hospital itself was constructed to be attached to the house too. If you explore the campus, there's even a small graveyard with the original owner's tombstone as well as some other family members of his. Additionally, there's a sign that says something along the lines of, this is dedicated to the slaves that worked and died on this plantation. Anyway, one of the stories that has been passed down among the employees there for decades is that a young girl in the Irishman's family, one of his daughters or grandchildren, passed away on the plantation at a really young age, and that her ghost still lingers around the house and the facility, and that there are certain patient rooms that have an unusual amount of um, paranormal activity, I guess you could call it. Now one day I was walking past one of these rooms and in my peripheral I could have swore that I saw a young girl who looked to be about 9 or 10 years old sitting on the bed. She was wearing a sort of colonial looking dress, appropriate for the time period in which she was alive that is, and looked at me directly in the eyes when I turned to look at her. I was incredibly startled and my mind raced for a few seconds trying to convince myself that she wasn't actually there. I walked a few feet past the room, gathered my courage to go back and by the time that I did, she had disappeared from sight. She didn't have any ethereal qualities or anything like that, nothing otherworldly or strange. She literally just looked like a real person sitting there in plain view. During my time there, I never really heard of anyone else who saw her or as clearly as I did anyway, but every once in a while, one of my co-workers or a patient would experience something strange, like doors opening and slamming shut. I remember one patient in particular that ran out of his room white as a sheet and said that while he was lying in his bed, his bathroom door slammed on its own. It was so loud that I even heard it from the nurse's station myself. This patient was there for addiction and had no history of hallucinations or anything. Anyway, I just thought that I would share this because it feels good to get it off my chest. Thanks for listening.